Hi, I'm Ken Stanley. I live in San Francisco and I just started a new social network. It's actually a serendipity network called Maven. I can tell you a little story about this book, Kenneth. So this is the second physical <laughs> copy I've got of your book. And you know why? Um, oh, I lend it out to that? some of my friends and my friend Kate uh, loved it so much that I never saw it back again. So um, just, so, just so I can have the <laughs> Bible in my studio, um, I've, I've got the very second nice, nice. copy of it. But, um, but yeah, you know, I can't really think of any book that I've read that has changed my thinking as much as this book has. Uh, it has massive implications, not only for philosophy, but also for how we as artificial intelligence researchers think about building the next generation of AI. To achieve your highest goals, you have to be willing to abandon them. We have a nose for the interesting. That's how we got this far. That's how civilization came out. That's why the history of innovation is so amazing. Everything washes out when we start ruling by committee. Like, we have to allow people to follow their passions to their extremes. And yet we run society as if this actually makes any sense at all. I think the gradient of interestingness is probably the best expression of like the ideal divergent search. You get to this problem that like, I don't know how to formalize interestingness. What you get to then are proxies for interestingness. That not everything that's novel is interesting, but just about everything that's interesting is novel. It is in my personality and nature to want to overthrow this, I guess we could say, tyranny of objectives. My particular area of interest and in research has been in what's called neuroevolution, which is a combination of neural networks and evolutionary computation. So I'm saying we gotta flip this completely. Like the smart part is the exploration, the dumb part is the objective part, because it's freaking easy. The first in interview that you had with me, that was like incredible. Yeah, and that was early um, on. I remember I, I used Blender to create this 3D environment yeah. for the stepping stones and uh, that was so crazy. I couldn't believe that. I was like, wow, that's like the coolest thing I've ever seen. Like for just about anything that I've ever said. Because it's, it's like a music. It's like this 3D thing moving around. It's like, wow, this is like seriously professional. Well, it wasn't professional, um, but yeah. So, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. that kind of thing could be cool. When you left OpenAI, you had um, an interesting conversation with Sam Altman. This is obviously a huge departure from my career trajectory. Like that's one reason I'm, I'm nervous because like I, I'm known for AI yeah, research. Like that's where my reputation is staked and I'm like just leaving it to do a social network. He said that, you know, the thing that I think you need to do is to think about the theme of your career, not what you've been doing. Like you've been doing AI research. That's what you've been doing. But what is the theme, the thread that connects everything you've been doing? Like even maybe since before your career, like what are you about as a person? It's not AI research. Because he said, for example, like take my career. And what he said was that I have realized that I am all about scaling. It's scaling. That's what connects all these things. You scale a startup. But the beautiful thing is that AI is all about scaling. There's a deep insight there, actually. Um, you know, like to understand that at the heart of this AI currently is the idea of scaling. And there's nobody better than Sam, whose entire life is about scaling things um, to actually like, you know, supercharge the scaling. Now, I personally don't know if scaling is about every, everything AI is about. Like, I'm not totally bought into the idea that it's all about scaling. And I'm not even sure Sam would even claim that. I'm not putting, I don't mean to put words in his mouth, um, but it's the thing that ties together his career. So it's what he's about, not necessarily all AI is about, but what he's about is scaling. And it's just made things click for me, uh, not just like about me, but about him. Like that was the first thing I thought was, wow, this is so interesting that I understand him better. Like in this instant, it was such a short thing to explain, but it just made me understand why is he even here? Like why is Sam Altman in charge of OpenAI? Then I just suddenly understood this. It's scaling, that's who he is. He's like the best in the world in scaling. And then he said, you don't seem, you know, you're not, you, the theme that cuts across everything you've done, like the book that you wrote, the research that you've done, it's this open-endedness stuff. It's divergence. You're interested in, you seem interested in like these freedom exploratory type of systems, like divergence in, in, in all kinds of contexts. I'm about scaling. I don't think he said this literally, but basically the way I took it is, I'm about scaling, you're about divergence. That, that sounded so neat and nice. So Professor Kenneth Stanley has created a new type of social network, a serendipity network, where all of the popularity contest is gone. The likes are gone. It's designed to accumulate information, to foster creativity, just like things work in the real world. What it is not is a popularity contest. And that um, is clearly, I think, a radical move because basically all social media 
I don't think there's an exception. It's a popularity contest. Um, you've got like buttons, you've got popularity, you've got follows, you've got popularity. This is all driven by that. Um, and so we have actually taken that away. Um, we don't use those mechanisms. Um, and so the question then is, what do you actually do in a system like that? You've taken away our drugs of choice. Um, of course, it's kind of like a detox. Um, so we're going to actually make your life more healthy, hopefully. Like, that's the hope here. But how? Like, how does it stay interesting? Well, the thing that really drives our system is following interests. So, like, one way that we put it is that you follow interests instead of following in influencers. Um, and so following interests means that influence... It means that interests are kind of uh, first-class citizens um, where, like, you can follow an interest in our system the way you would follow a person, maybe in another system, it even has its own profile for the interest. And these interests arise whole cloth out of nothing um, in the system. Uh, so it's not like there's this fixed set, like in a lot of systems, there's, like, fixed sets of things that you can join or follow. Like, this is just uh, created as it goes. Um, and so users kind of have an experience where they're discovering and adding new interests. Often they're through other users. Like you'll see interests that other users follow. Sometimes you'll even find out if someone follows an interest because of you, because that's kind of a way of uh, having a more maybe a, a healthy form of validation socially. So it's like, oh, I got someone interested in something rather than, you know, somebody likes um, my post or somebody's trying to follow me uh, like I'm a brand. But you got somebody interested in something because it's about the interest. And so people are finding new interests also through new posts. Um, like it, it, when, when you post something on the system, an artificial intelligence will extract interests out of it and it'll suggest those to people who are uh, exposed to that post. And so people can find new interests that way too. And so adding interests is kind of the recreational activity instead of liking and following. Fans of MLST will know that we've carved out a niche in the kind of center point between philosophy and artificial intelligence. And this book, the episode that we did on, on this book, was really emblematic of us starting to cut out that niche a few years ago. The main thesis of Kenneth and Joel's book is that objectives or consensus mechanisms lead to the enshittification of society, systems, and everything. There's nothing really insightful or interesting about just doing objective optimization. Yeah, we've got plenty of good algorithms for doing that, and it's not counterintuitive at all. It totally makes sense, but it's not going to get us hardly anywhere interesting whatsoever. It's kind of the curse of optimization. And what that means is when you build an optimization system, you have to take a metric. You have to take a utility function or a cost function and you have to optimize it. But then it suffers from the shortcut rule and Goodhart's law. The shortcut rule is that you get what you optimize for, exactly what you optimize for and nothing else. Which means if you can't specify all of the richness and complexity that you want to capture in the cost function, then it's all gone. And Goodhart's law is this very interesting idea that when a target becomes a measure, it ceases to become a good measure. Which means many of the systems we design, including current social networks, are divorced of all of the richness and creativity which exists in the real world. We need to create systems that capture the creative generative processes which exist in our physical and social worlds. And with naive objective optimization, it's impossible. In my opinion, the reason why ChatGPT is the antithesis of creativity is it's designed to reduce entropy. It's designed to make things simple. Whereas a creative process is about producing new information. So there's a tug of war with things like GPT which are centralized because we have access to creativity. We have access to serendipitous novelty and we can put it into GPT. But GPT is always pushing back on us. It wants to make things simple. This is model bias. In order to produce a truly creative process, we need to design platforms which eliminate this centralizing force. Maybe you could call it a self-organizing worldwide group chat. Um, it's got this self-organizing component, which I think is interesting to think about that, you know, so what's happening, you know, usually when you go into a forum, like you go into Reddit or something like that, and you have to choose which silo are you going to be addressing. This is obviously advantageous if you want to talk to people who share your interest because you can choose a place where the interest is reflected. So go to that particular forum. But the thing is, like, that really is limiting when you think about it because of the fact that, like, often 
as conversations meander within something like that, you touch on things that other people in other forums would have really found interesting. Um, you know, for example, like if I was uh, had an issue with, say, the architecture in San Francisco, I mean, I could go talk to the San Francisco subreddit and like tell people about my, my, my problem with it. Um, but then it starts to touch on general urban planning, let's say. Well, there is an urban planning subreddit and none of them see this conversation. So they won't be part of it. Um, they probably would have had something to say, but it might have been something interesting. Um, that's where self-organization self -organization could have kicked in. I mean, people could have actually come in from there. And that is what Maven does, like constantly, always. Like every single thing anybody says is reanalyzed by the AI to think about what is now, who to whom is this now interesting as a conversation? And then those people are drawn in. So you're having, because of that, basically different communities are getting crossed over constantly and cross-pollinating. Um, because as the conversation meanders, new communities are brought in. Um, and that's what I mean by self-organizing. So it's constantly organizing around like who should be interested. Um, and, uh, and, and so you, you don't have to think about like which silo do I belong in. You just send it out, it gets sent to people who would find it interesting. And as the conversation continues, it'll just reorganize um, around those people. Um, and by adding interest, you're expanding your kind of like serendipity surface horizons, things that might be interesting to you. And the system works in such a way that like it's trying to expose things that match your interests. But in doing so, it will also sometimes expose things slightly adjacent. And so your interest will gradually expand um, as you discover, oh, I actually am interested, you know, like I didn't even think about 3D printing, but now I realize actually that's something I would like to follow, like what's going on there when people talk about that. And then that comes like part of your part of your interest set. Um, and so if you think about it in aggregate, like the system is a giant interest graph that's growing over time. The more people come in, the more we discover new interests, because these aren't things, like I said, they're not from a stock list. So it's just growing and growing. And this interest graph lets us understand things like what interests relate to others, you know, because we know people who follow this interest also follow that interest. Or like we see these interests co-occur a lot in posts, like when people post like often AI and ethics occur at the same time or something like that. And so we have this like really interesting graph that I don't think anywhere else has um, showing how everything is related in, in, a, in an interest graph and rather than in a person graph, um, which again, I think is arguably more healthy um, since it doesn't have this popularity uh, contest act aspect to it. And so the last thing I just wanted to mention about like how it works as you're kind of expanding interest and discovering new things on the system is one thing that may people may wonder is, but where's the quality control? Um, you know, because like the, the, the kind of um, top line billing for things like likes or follows is quality control. Um, it has all these other implications. You know, it has convergent aspects. Like when we have consensus, we get convergence, which is an unintended consequence of likes. You know, so if like a million people like something, that's definitely consensus. But what happens is that we have these convergent points like throughout the day on these very, very high agreement things. And that filters out diversity. So we're counteracting that. And that's a good thing. So you get way more diversity is one effect of a system that's about following interest rather than um, following influencers. But you still may be wondering, so you took out this thing, which is the supposed, the purported quality mechanism, what is left there? Well, we were doing something interesting, which is more subtle, which is worth a little mention, which is we're using something called a minimal criterion to understand what is not actually good content. So actually, we're not interested in maximization. Um, and I speak a lot, like when I speak about like um, why greatness cannot be planned about like what's bad about maximization and optimization on everything. So we actually got rid of the idea of optimizing content. Um, but we do something which is saying there's a minimal threshold. Below that, we do try to circulate less if it's below a minimal threshold. And we have different ways to measure engagement to like sort of set our minimal threshold. But above that threshold, there's no contest. Everything is treated evenly and agnostically. Um, and so you get this kind of churn of ideas that are all of like minimal, at least minimal interestingness. And it's worth noting that this kind of idea of a minimal criterion has been used in research in the field of open-endedness. And there's also an interpretation of natural evolution based on minimal criterion. So it's not just like a totally ad hoc thing, 
and it does really interesting things. Like it leads to a very rapid, fast divergence and in increasing complexity, like in artificial systems, um, but without convergent properties. And it's extremely simple. And so this is a completely different kind of quality mechanism, but there is, it is in there. Um, and so you should be, and one, maybe philosophically, just to make it make some sense is that kind of the philosophy behind a middle criterion is that it's really just pointless after a certain point to argue about is something better than something. It's like once things hit a good enough, especially in the world of subjectivity, like if you're talking about like movies or something, or even like intelligence, like if you're talking about like, is this guy more intelligent than that guy? At some point, it just stops mattering like on an absolute scale. It's true, like below a certain point, it's like it can matter a lot. You know, it's like if, you, if you're like in like, you know, the, the disability range of IQ or something. But above a certain point, um, it just gets ridiculous to like split hairs. I'm like, is that actually better? Like this person said this and that person said that. Which is the best? statement they're both interesting um then we actually try to rate them and then you get rich get your get richer phenomena and all kinds of artificial aspects start to come into play which have really nothing to do with any kind of true objective absolute sense of quality because there is none in subjective domains so we can say like above a certain amount let's not play that game it's stupid because it leads to conversion it filters out all the diversity and let's let diversity reign when you're within that range where things are good enough that it's not degenerating. My couple of co-founders, um, one of them is Jimmy Secretan, who um, some people might know. I worked with him many years ago on the Pick Breeder uh, project. Um, Jimmy actually was the lead of that project. And um, we've talked for years about maybe reuniting at some point. Um, he's had a lot of industry, industry experience since then. He was a VP at Brave recently. Um, and so it, it was just a good opportunity um, to get back together and uh, work together again. Um, and my other co-founder is named Blas Moros, and he has some really unique experience building online communities. Uh, he's built some communities like uh, the Lattice Work, which some people may have heard of, or um, also something called the Rabbit Hole, where people follow um, books and readings together that he's uh, he's been sharing with people. This book changed my life, Kenneth. This book changed my life. If there were just a few things you can summarize, you know, from this book, what would it be? So the book is um, a result of AI research, and it's a it's a really strange story because it's very unusual that AI research results lead to something that looks a little bit like social critique. In fact, I think I'm unaware of any other example like that. And I certainly wasn't trying to do something like that. That wasn't my career goal. Um, but the thing is that we were seeing results that had really large scale implications outside of AI. Um, and I mean, in hindsight, it starts to make sense to me that like if if you're really trying to understand intelligence, which is like this one of the most salient aspects of being human, then you should expect to learn something about what it means to be human. I mean, that, that seems to make some sense in hindsight. So that should be happening. That should be a side effect of our field. Like to the extent we don't do that, it might be a sign that we aren't necessarily digging in the right places or, or learning the things we should be learning. Uh, but in any case, we, we what we found was this really strange paradoxical uh, uh, phenomenon, which is that pursuing an objective can actually get in the way of achieving the objective. But it's more than that. It's also that it gets in the way of achieving anything else, even outside of the objective you started with. Um, and this is something that originated from observing results from experiments. So this is not um, like an opinion. Um, this is just empirical results that we were observing and experiments that we did. Um, some of those experiments had people in the loop. So we had people searching through spaces, finding, in, in our case, pictures was the original experiment. It's called Pick Breeder. And we saw this phenomenon of people only finding things when they're not looking for it, um, which is really hard to absorb. So you can only find things if you're not looking for them. You know, it's like some kind of Zen statement or something like that. But if you think about it, it starts to make sense, even algorithmically, because it also sounds philosophical, but it's really an algorithmic observation. But algorithmically, it makes sense because there's this this phenomenon of deception in complex spaces, which is like a well understood. I mean, sometimes we use other other words for it. Uh, like we might call it like getting stuck in a local optimum or something like that, or premature convergence. But really what deception means is that it appears that you're going in the right direction when you're going in the wrong direction or vice versa. It could appear that you're going in the wrong direction when you're going in the right direction. And the thing about that is that it's much more pathological and pervasive 
than the way that we usually think about it, because it's not a surprise that that exists in search spaces, but it's so pervasive in spaces that are complex. And that is what we didn't appreciate, I think, and that the book is really keying in on. Because you see, like in complex spaces, that should be the rule rather than the exception. Like by complex, I just mean things that are hard, like things in the world that are hard to solve. So something like creating AGI or curing cancer or creating um, infinite renewable energy or, or things we might want to do. Uh, those things, the stepping stones that lead to those things don't look like those things. They aren't obvious, in other words. Like, if they were obvious, then we would just do them and they wouldn't be considered hard problems. So obviously, we don't know what the stepping stones are, which means that when we do find the right stepping stones, they will be surprising, which means they won't be things that we would initially guess are the important things you need to do to get to those things. Um, and this was initially observed in these artificial search spaces like PickBreeder, um, but it was clear that this is a general principle in all complex spaces um, because they will always have this kind of circuitous property or else they're not complex. It's basically like a truism. And so the, the, the problem... Uh, which the, the implication for the problem we have in society gradually grew in my mind over time after this, like looking at the AI results, especially from also talking to people about the results, because people often would ask, what does it mean for me? Because people would say, uh, like AI conferences, they'd say, I have, I have objectives. Like, is this like applicable to the way I think about things? Or is this only about algorithms? But of course, it's not only about algorithms, because we all are facing search spaces. Like, that's a problem that's generally ubiquitous in life, not just in algorithms. And because of that, it, it started to emerge in my mind that like this matters to people. This matters to institutions. It matters to governments. It matters to education. Like, there's objectives everywhere. It's completely saturating everything that we do. And if this deceptive principle, which I call the objective paradox, because it's a paradox that pursuing something can cause you not to achieve it, if it holds with really tough problems, then like we're all in trouble because like we're all doing everything by setting objectives. And the more I thought about it, the more this seemed like a serious social problem, um, even though it's not the kind of thing, you know, that is currently debated in society. Like you don't have like protests going on about like anti-objective movements or things like that. But that made it even more seem like this needs to be brought up. At least we can have a conversation. Maybe I can't change the way things work in the world, but at least we could have a conversation. Um, and it seemed important to to bring it up because nobody it doesn't seem to be on anyone's radar. And I mean, just just give one concrete example. Like think about like when you apply for science funding, since I know a lot of people who watch this show probably do. They want to know what your deliverables are. That's your objectives. Like, what are you going to achieve? Like, we're already off to a bad start um, because that's not how innovative systems work. Innovative systems work by collecting stepping stones and not knowing where you're going because they're interesting in their own right, because we don't know which ones will lead to what. Um, and already the entire science funding system almost across the world works in the opposite objective paradox way. Um, and so that's a mistake. And most institutions work that way. Um, and so I, 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 we wrote the book, Joel Lemon and I, um, to try to highlight this and start a conversation. In a way, a goal or a stepping stone is like knowledge. So I kind of think of your your philosophy as, as describing a kind of epistemic roadblock. So the, the paradox is that in science, we want to accumulate knowledge and we're shooting ourselves in the foot because you're saying, well, you're only allowed to operate inside the space of this known knowledge because the goal presumably shrouds out any other knowledge that you don't already know. So it's about this kind of paradox of the unknown unknowns. But I wanted to bring one other thing in because some might say that um, it's, you know, there's in reinforcement learning, there's exploration versus exploitation. And you have a fixed goal, but people might argue, well, yeah, you have a fixed goal, but uh, there's this implicit motivation, you know, so, so the agent can still learn mm -hmm. sub goals and mm -hmm. do lots of kind of weird and wonderful things that might be somewhat orthogonal to the end goal. And I've always felt that, I mean, again, this is a teleology question. The reason why <clears throat> there is no teleology in evolution, it's a process that is divergent. It generates entropy and, and complexity all the time. And that is precisely because there is no um, end teleology. You have these independent agents kind of doing things on their own and not necessarily sharing information with each other. Uh, yeah, so it's true that um, you know exploration versus exploitation is, is, is very uh, well known and well studied. I mean, it's no surprise to anybody that we should do some exploration. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a couple things about that that I think fall very short of the, the kind of 
uh, observations the book is making about like how, how ex what exploration really should be, you know, and, and one of them is basically like related to what you just said that that it's just like just having this objective at all in mind can be just too much, uh, too much of a drag on your ability to explore that it just doesn't all add up. I mean, and we should we should note that like of course, and I we can see it in the book that modest objectives do work. So the book is not saying no objectives ever work. That's important to concede here. Um, modest objectives can work, and a lot of the time, reinforcement learning, when it works, works because it's what I would call a modest objective. So, like, you, you keep your eye on the ball, um, and exploration, you could think of as a little bit of distraction moving you around, but you need to have that distraction because you need to sometimes get off deceptive paths, um, and it works. That works out. Um, but the problem is when, like, you're looking at something that's, like, radically ambitious. You know, that's when, you know, I talk about something uh, like curing cancer. Like, this is, like, way beyond, like, where we understand what will lead to what. Um, then it actually doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, it becomes actually like a, a huge weight on your ability to explore. Um, and that leads to, you know, that, that like it's actually the, the case that having an objective is much more powerful than a force for diversity. Like sometimes, you know, what this, this field that the original experiments that led to the book led to a field called quality diversity algorithms. And this whole field is sort of about this idea that quality is, 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 is kind of like a a huge, powerful force, and diversity is this very delicate feather. And you you try to combine them together, and if you're not careful about it, it's always going to be that quality crushes diversity. Diversity is the hard thing to do. And so that leads to kind of the, the second point I want to make about exploration versus exploitation is that exploration is actually a very complicated subject. And when we think about it as just making random moves, that is the most trivializing way to think about what exploration means. Exploration is an intelligent process. It's not random. I mean, of course, in an algorithm, it might be defined as something random, but real exploration means following gradients of interestingness, which is highly information rich, like understanding what's interesting in the world. People are really good at that. Like that's one of the remaining deficits, I think, for models today, um, artificial models, because um, understanding interestingness is an extremely difficult problem. Um, but those gradients, you can think of them as gradients you can follow. Um, that's what it means to explore. It's not taking a random move in a reinforcement learning algorithm. And so exploration algorithms, like forget about having an objective, like it's its own topic in its own right. Like the way to motivate, to, to represent where you want to go. What does it mean to be interesting? What is novelty? Things like that. They all have to be confronted in order to understand what it means to uh, explore in an informed way. And what that will do then is it will accumulate things that are interesting. And some of those things will lead to other interesting things. And eventually one of those might turn out to be the stepping stone that leads to something you care about. Or it may turn out to be something someone else cared about, but what you're doing is collecting stepping stones. And so you're making it more likely something something important will happen in the future. Yeah, and we were talking about this minimum uh, criterion earlier. But I suppose what we're trying to do is, is create algorithms which are naturally plausible, maybe even biologically plausible, because we see these fascinating dynamics in the real world. And we select features of it, you know, so it needs to have diversity preservation, it needs to be entropy generating, um, uh, agents need to follow their own gradient of interestingness. And it, the, almost all of the algorithms that, that you've been associated with are population methods. So this kind of population idea seems really interesting. And I guess like one, one question is, how far can we go with computers, right? I mean, the the reason why we have an interesting um, concept built into us is because we're physically and socially embedded. So it's not necessarily that we have knowledge of what's interesting. It's quite serendipitous. But the, the, the I think the key is that the knowledge is actually embedded in the system. Like the reason why a bird knows how to mm -hmm. fly, well, a bird doesn't know how to fly. The knowledge of flight is actually encoded into its physicality and how it's embedded in the system. Right. So I guess I'm saying like mm -hmm. that's how interesting this works in the real world. And we want mm -hmm. to write algorithms to do that artificially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the trick in this is that we really want these algorithms to do things that are interesting to us. Um, so it's it's true, like uh, our experience and the things that we find interesting are idiosyncratic in some way. I mean, I guess it's 
it gets philosophical because there's a question, is there any absolute way of thinking about what it means to be interesting? Um, but it's like if you started a whole new world and things just evolved inside of that world, independently of this world, uh, you know, to what extent is that interesting to us? Um, and it, that's actually like an artificial life kind of view, um, which I think probably some of it actually is interesting. Um, but like at the cutting edge, like that's hard. Like in other words, like the cutting edge of what's cutting edge for us. Um, so like the cutting edge of technology, of all aspects of society, of art, of music, of of uh political organization, like all of that stuff has a cutting edge. Um, and those things are interesting to us for idiosyncratic reasons that have to do with how we developed on this earth and our embodiment and all kinds of things. And so like, it's just, we have to somehow, if we want to incorporate machines into that cutting edge so that they can explore along with us to push it forward um, in ways that we would actually care about, then they have to absorb a lot of the understanding that we have that comes from our legacy somehow so that they can draw from that to understand what's interesting. And yeah, the problem is it's non-trivial and information rich. I think it's just not like just like a couple of rules. Um, like it's like your entire lifetime of experience bears on what you find interesting. Um, and so to endow them with sufficient representation to capture that is very challenging. And it doesn't just happen because they absorb all the language on the internet is the problem. Like that would be convenient. Um, but interestingness is another matter than just knowledge. Um, and so it's, this is a real tricky thing, uh, but we can, um, we can imagine this happening. I mean, I, I can imagine trying to, you know, bring them into the fold of where we are at the cutting edge and helping them to see what's interesting. And they would, you know, gather some degree, pick up some degree of, of uh, instinct from us. Um, I just want to point out that there's a whole completely different way of thinking about how to get interestingness, which would be, which would be like from first principles, kind of, like just starting with single cell things and just thinking like, well, would it just become interesting? Because I mean, evolution did that. So I guess it's it's a little bit um, it's a little bit circular because like we're a product of that process. So it's like, well, that's why we think it's interesting. I mean, you could argue that like, well, if we weren't, we wouldn't find it as interesting. But I don't totally believe that because like it seems like to me that it's like not debatable that what happened on this planet is interesting, no matter where you come from. Uh, now, I mean, we could definitely debate that. But like, to me, it's just like, there is some level at which like something happened here that's interesting. Like, it's not clear to me that like the TV show you like is interesting in some absolute sense. But just generally, the entire process of evolution on Earth, all the way up to humans is somehow, it just seems intrinsically interesting. And I think the reason is because like, there's some built in, there's some built in conditions that uh, that that encourage non-triviality of some sort or complexity, um, which is sufficient to be somewhat interesting at least, um, from from the point of view of anybody who's intelligent, I guess you could say. And so that's obviously very debatable and get a huge side discussion about this. Um, but I think it's important to still think about it even outside of the philosophical part of it, because we do want to understand if there are relatively simple principles that can help us to get a leg up on this. Um, like in terms of actually producing interestingness, like generatively producing it, um, like that are not, that don't require like knowledge of what it was like to live your entire life and every other person who's ever lived on the planet. Like that's a lot to ask. Like if there are some the basic fundamentals um, that can sort of scratch at the surface of interestingness, then that can help us um, get our feet, foot in the door and, and start to move forward. I really like this idea that interestingness is just the knowledge that we don't understand. So we we have these, um, when I say anthropocentric, I mean we have these like kind of human perspectives on things. And we think of knowledge as the kind of stuff you get on Wikipedia. But you know, knowledge is everywhere. And, and in a sense, I, I think of intelligence as being everywhere. Intelligence is distributed far outside the brain. I was reading a book by Max Bennett earlier arguing that, you know, language is in the brain. Well, I don't think language is in the brain. Language is, is an organism. Um, if anything, language tells us what to do, not the other way around. So, um, yeah, it's just a completely different uh, perspective. And, and our anthropocentric priors really kind of guide how we how we think, if that makes sense. But but just just to, to close the loop, though, I was uh, watching mm -hmm. a presentation by Jim, Jim Fan from in NVIDIA. And, you know, he's kind of got this these three axes where you have embodiment and you have skill and you have realities. And he's got these different agents that operate on different parts in that 3D space. And I 
just kind of disagree, just based on my last point, because I think all of these things are entangled together. Like, he's making the point that, oh, we could have these foundational agents that could generalise between different forms and different realities and have different skills. And they're all the same thing. Right. All of these things are just embedded in the world. I guess a reality could be an environment and a form could be... I mean, I kind of think of those two as basically being affordances. So how can I interface with the environment? But if you think about it, interface... I mean, you're great to talk about this because you did this poet um, um, paper which mm. was kind of diversifying, doing curriculum learning across different environments. But, but in a sense, the environment affords an interface. You can only interact with it in a certain way. So you can kind of, you can kind of think of the embodiment and the environment as being the same thing. But if you were trying to argue that intelligence was abstracted away from physicality, that you could build this general agent, mm. that you could just plump into any world and it would just automatically mm. be able to do anything. So do you, do you see what I mean? There's this tug of war between I think intelligence just is the physical and social world. And another school of thought is, no, you have these intelligent agents that just know what to do in any world. I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, that's 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 a, a a hard question to think about, um, like these other worlds and how they would relate, um, or if there is something like truly general beyond any world, and they could work successfully in any world that's conceivable. Uh, yeah, I I wouldn't be confident in that. Um, I mean, it, it that I, I agree with. I think I agree with that, but I but I also not at, always sure like when you get down to very specific points like it has to have a body then i become less sure of things like that um like is that really essential in our world to have a body in order to be an active participant in the you know advance of knowledge or something like that? i'm not sure that you need a body for that um you need some exposure to our world though i'm not saying you wouldn't have some exposure um and so uh, of course we live in a physical environment with like vision and sound and things and that there's some of that's gonna have to get in somehow um in order to, to really participate in a meaningful way um and so but I, I just don't know exactly what the you know desiderata are like that you have to have this or you have to have that I, i'd be a little more open to different variations than you know some strict like person who's only about embodiment or something like that very interesting. Just before we go on, on to, the, to the other bits we discussed, um, maybe we should just describe pick breeder in, in really simple terms. So this, this picture on, on the front of your book came from pick breeder, right? Pick breeder was an experiment in open endedness. Um, I was really interested in systems that are what, what, I, what I call open ended and now this like kind of recognizes it as a subfield in, in machine learning, basically open endedness, but open ended systems. Actually, I should note. Um, for historical reasons that the, the term open in this where, where I first encountered is in artificial life, where there was a sub community there called open ended evolution or OEE. Um, and so I, I was really interested in it from from that perspective. And um, of course, evolution is often cited as like the, 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 the most canonical precedent of open endedness. Like it's this process that for uh, more than a billion years has been, you know, diverging into more and more interesting stuff and doesn't seem to end. It's almost eternal. Um, and so, so it, it started out with these kind of open ended evolution researchers in artificial life. Um, but I always thought that this is a general issue across, like not just artificial life, but AI as well, because I think open endedness is also the, the big thing that characterizes what it means to be human. It's, it's interesting because it's what created humans, like evolution created us. So we're a product of an open-ended system. But I also think we produce open-endedness and that's like the most salient thing about us. It's so like civilization is basically a giant open-ended system produced on top of human intelligence. So there's like an open endedness sandwich with us in the middle. You know, we come out of evolution and then we produce civilization and both are open ended on both sides. Um, and so to understand us and intelligence, I have this intuitive feeling we need to understand open ended processes because AI will have to be one eventually. And a lot of the time, that's like the last thing missing, I feel like. Like AI can do all these impressive analytic things, it can like solve a test or something, they answer your question brilliantly. But like it doesn't produce things that move civilization forward. Um, that's like inventions and ideas and, you know, like things that change the way we think. And that just doesn't really happen. Um, and that's like what it means to be human, I think. Because if you think about like what uh, what is um, 
how how much what do you think what does it elicit in you if you hear that somebody can multiply 10 digit numbers in their head it's impressive but i don't wouldn't say oh the humanity it's not that kind of thing where you're just like clutching your heart like that's just so moving it's just like that's impressive that's that's like a computation the humanity comes out in like when someone invents something you know it moves you it changes your life like that's humanity um and that's open endedness and so i th- and so I think that's what we need to capture. And so, and also just as a practical matter for AI people, the thing, the other thing about it that I think is important is that because it produced us, like we are a product of an open-ended system, we might need to create an open-ended system to produce another us. Um, and so that, that was really motivating me a lot with like the pick breeder. Um, I want to understand how these things work because I wanted to understand how brain-like things could evolve uh, artificially. Um, and so because I'm mentioning all this like in detail because like when you hear what this is, it doesn't sound like a really serious experiment. It's like what we're going to do is we're going to have people go on the internet and breed pictures. Um, so we're giving them an interface where they could see a picture and then they could see several pictures and then they could choose one and it becomes a parent and it has children. Um, just like if you're breeding dogs or breeding horses or something like that. Um, it could be, you know, it could be like sexual or asexual. It doesn't really matter. It, it, it could be both, but a lot of people would just do it asexual, meaning one, one parent, because this isn't a computer, so you could do whatever you want. Um, and so, so people would choose pictures and, and make children. And so you hear that, you're like, oh, that's, that's like a toy. Like, what, what is the point of all of this? But you see, the point of it for me, it wasn't the toy, even though I was hoping people would enjoy it as a toy because that would get people to, to use it, but was to see the unfolding divergent process of discovery. That was really what interested me. I wanted to see a new tree of life form on the internet a tree of life like you know the kind of phylogenetic trees you see like with the single cell at the bottom and humans in some branch somewhere um i wanted to see a new one happen um because i wanted to understand the process it's not the individual images that i care really about like there are images that they were pretty impressive like people found things through random mutation so this is not like dali or something this is not like modern image generation this is like old school stuff through random mutation they would find things like butterflies and skulls and cars and really impressive of discoveries, extreme needles in a haystack. Um, but it wasn't the individual images that interested me. I wanted to understand the process because I thought if I could see an actual open-ended process, then I could understand algorithmically how it works. Um, and this is something we desperately needed to understand. And the problem is there's not a lot of reference to see processes like this. You know, evolution is a, is a reference, but we can't see it because it's buried in the ground, like you need to go digging and and get fossils out of the ground. And I wanted to see every single little step exactly what happened in a process like that. So I could totally analyze it and understand it. I just thought something interesting will happen. Um, And it's, you know, it's notable that I didn't know what would would happen. I didn't know what we would discover. Um, It was totally unclear, which made it very hard to get to get funding, actually, um, because it's not they're like, well, what's the point of all of this? But the point was to see the process. Um, And so we put this out there. And indeed, the, 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 the result was we, we did discover this very shocking fundamental thing about objectives, like the, the people on that site, it turned out when they found these amazing things like the butterfly or the car, uh, it was because they were not looking for them. Or to be more clear, it's because everybody along that trajectory was not looking for it. Um, like the very last couple steps, someone might have been thinking because they realized they're getting close. You know, they might have been thinking, oh, I'm getting close to a car, so I'm going to try to optimize this towards a car. But all the other steps along that trajectory, nobody was thinking about cars. Um, and so the only way to find things on there is by not looking for them. And for people who were looking for things, which is most people, because that's how we've been trained to think. Most of us are acculturated to set an objective and go towards it by the time we're adults. So most people actually don't like pick breeder, I, I found. I think that's true because they would automatically come in with this predisposition towards setting an objective. And then it would be frustrating, be extremely frustrating because it's a deceptive space, like any complex space, but it looks like they're going in the right direction. They're not. So they, they hit a dead end. They experience this intuitively. So they feel stuck. And then they're just like, this, this sucks. And then they're like, but why did all these other people succeed in discovering all this stuff? Like, it doesn't make sense, but it's very frustrating to an objective person. And so I think this is why a lot of people would just leave very quickly and never come back because yeah. it just doesn't work like the way you would expect the toy to work. A quick point, but um, there's another amazing book called The Language Game. And it basically talks about, you know, I, I, there's this idea that, that what if culture and language itself was alive? It was a living, breathing organism. And the, um, 
Yeah, so it, it, it's it's this idea that essentially we humans have this proto ability to um, use improvisation to make sense in the moment, and we also have other proto abilities like shared attention. Even babies will look at things; they'll they'll make sure you're looking at it. So there's an interactive shared attention process, and there's a whole bunch of things that we do that give rise to this incredible kind of social complexification that we have. And it's a bit mysterious how it happened in evolution, but the fascinating thing is that I think the real intelligence of humans is culture and society. If you take an individual human and you put them on Mars or put them in a in the wilderness, then that human, it's like going back in time a long, long while. So it's almost mm-hmm. like our collective mm-hmm. intelligence is the is the culture. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then if you contrast that to something mm-hmm. like GPT, so they said, well, GPT isn't learning how to play charades. It's learning to find incredibly complex patterns across billions of words of language. Humans in GPT can write short stories, technical manuals and press releases and do simple tasks with language such as answering questions. But GPT is not mimicking the human mind. It has no mind at all. So there's always this kind of interesting tug of war between like, you know, creating the actual um, thing which has the high resolution dynamics, which is alive in the same way versus kind of creating this very simplified version that appears to be like the thing you want to create, but actually isn't. Yeah, that's true. I mean, in some way when you say like the intelligence is the society and the culture, like it is basically saying it's, it's this collection of stepping stones are part of the intelligence of the process, you know, because I always speak in terms of stepping stone collection and open ended processes. And so like, that's what makes them really powerful is that like, the longer they run, the more stepping stones there are. It's like the next generation of inventions are going to be more interesting than the last generation, because there's more inventions to build on. Um, and so you know, it's like back in the day when there's only like wheels and fire, there's only so many things you can do. But now you've got you know, you've got computers, uh, you've got the internet, so these are stepping stones that we can build on top of. Um, and it's the, the whole collection of stepping stones, which is all of our culture and society society is the the potential we have to do something new um so you could say that's a store of intelligence as part of an intelligence system i mean i think it makes it certainly means that any individual is empowered more uh to do more uh, to do more interesting things um yeah so that, yeah that's but, one way to think I about mean, it i mean just just a final point on that i, I think though the the real gap between us and machines is this creativity. And I think also autonomy mm. is, is part of that. So the reason why we have built this incredible culture, this infosphere with all of these stepping stones is because is every time you and I or any people have interactions, they um, creatively do things just to just to understand each other, just to just to. Um, make sense in the moment you use this ingenuity yeah. of creativity and then that just gets recursively rinsed and repeated and reapplied and all of these things just bubble up into our culture and um, there's just nothing like that in in AI systems I mean yeah. obviously the closest we yeah, have gotten true. to that yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, is all of the work that that you've done but I think the autonomy yeah. gap and the creativity yeah. gap that's that's the elixir that we don't yet have yeah, that that is actually interesting because I I've, I've often said that um, you know one of the keys to getting open-ended systems to work is that you you don't just want to have more solutions you want more opportunities or more problems is one way to think about it but I, they're not necessarily problems they're opportunities to do something new um, and so that's like where create that's what allows you to have creativity like you can't have Shakespeare if you don't have an audience like to actually listen to it um, and you can't have giraffes if you don't have trees but what's interesting is that we are both like as as organisms in this world both opportunities and agents in the world. We're creating opportunities for other people to do things just by existing. And that what you said just made me realize that like it's the creative opportunity that like every single interaction provides, um, which is causing things to move forward. It's like me talking to you right now, like you're presenting an opportunity to me and it's a creative opportunity. Like the way I'm addressing this conversation is actually creative because I'm trying to figure out like what is actually something that I can create here with you and also for the audience um, that's like not existing in the world yet. Like that's why I'm having the conversation. Like it already existed in the world. There'd be no point to have the conversation conversation um and it's kind of interesting that like everything is a creative act almost everything is a creative act in that sense like everything you confront confronts you with a new opportunity to do something creatively and that is that is really interesting how it's starkly different from the perspective of like gpt or something like it doesn't look at it wouldn't see things that way at all which is really bizarre you know because i I think a lot of us do see like each 
each interaction that we have as a new creative opportunity, although no one would probably articulate it that way. It just occurred to me now even to think of it like that. Um, but that's just like very deep in human nature that like you want something new to come out of this, not the same thing you just did yesterday. Um, and that's just not intrinsic at all uh, in the AI. It's not trying to do that. So yeah, it's not going to be a participant in the advance of things, of society, of culture and civilization, just not going to be a participant yet um, until we address that. Yeah, although final point on that, I think the autonomy gap is quite interesting because people anthropomorphize AI. They think of it as an agent or it could be an agent if only you gave it autonomy, even though they don't have agency. So they do silly things when you give them autonomy. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, people confuse combinatorial creativity with inventive creativity. And and also people confuse where the locus of the agency is. So it's more like a paintbrush. Mm. If I use a language model, I'm giving it the entropy. So I'm entropy smuggling mm. from my mm. physical and social world. And people mm. kind of get confused and they think, oh, the language model is, is giving mm. you the entropy. No, the entropy came from you. It might be mm. surprising what it what it gave mm. you. So, yeah, you, you know, mm. the, the, it, it's still interesting in the, in the sense that they are tools which have become established in, in, in our kind of ecosystem, but they're not agents and they yeah. don't they don't yeah. do things on their own. Yeah. 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 I agree that they, they have what you might call combinatorial creativity. Like they can combine two things and, and sometimes it's, it's really entertaining when they do that. Um, you, often though, the things that they combine are because you ask them to combine them. So it's actually that the real creative seed was from you, but then yeah. they do a good job with it. So that's actually entertaining. Um, but they can sometimes come up with their own combinations. Like it does happen. Um, and, but I also yeah, agree that that's not transformational type of creativity, that this is like a, a lower grade of creativity, but like even beyond that, I think the real problem is they don't really understand what's interesting. Um, like regardless of what kind of creativity we're, we're identifying, like I think this relates to things that Bowdoin said about creativity. Um, but like the regardless of even that, like it's just they don't really understand what's interesting. So they can come up with arbitrary combinations, but it's not because they really have an intuitive sense of this is going to be interesting to somebody. Like often there are things that already were combined by somebody else or otherwise are just like totally arbitrary and are only interesting because an AI did it, but not really interesting in their own right. It's not like something you would ever be like, oh, that was great that you came up with this bizarre combination of ideas. Um, you know, like like I had a, like, for example, yeah, I mean, one thing I had fun doing with GPT was like having it come up with ideas for movies. Um, it's just kind of funny, you know, and they, they can be yeah. quite entertaining like to hear these ideas. So, so you know, it, it came up with this idea, or I, I was asked at one point to come up with sequels. So it, it came up with um, a, a, a sequel to The Wizard of Oz. Um, where um, she comes back and the wizard is a drug addict <laughs> and she has to help him recover um, from his addiction. Um, and that's like, a, it's just like an arbitrary combination of ideas. Like it's, it's like, it's actually really funny because it came up with it, but I don't think that's actually a really interesting idea. Um, it's like, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't really follow from like the ethos of like this kind of like Wizard of Oz, like fiction that like he would turn into a drug addict and that would be like the next book. Um, but that's what it comes up with. So, so it's like that kind of combinatorial creativity it can do, but it's not, yeah, it just doesn't have a sense of true interestingness and novelty. And I think that's deep, deep in, in, in like a, a deep challenge, uh, for us right now is to overcome that. Um, if we, if we wanted to get to AGI, cause that, that's really a, a, like the, the star of human nature. Yes. I mean, this is so interesting. I will ask you other questions in a second, but uh, this is this is such a fascinating topic. I mean, um, I think of uh, creativity as something novel, which makes sense. The early versions of information retrieval were kind of content filtering, and then it became more collaborative filtering. And the kind of the, the bright line, I think, between those two worlds is one is is a social concept. So for, I mean, for, for me, creativity is about the instantiation of a durable social concept which means it's recognized that the relevancy mm -hmm. is is kind of like social proof right so um everyone thinks it's a good idea so it stays and you get these weird phenomena where you know things go viral only because of the social proof so it's got nothing whatsoever to do with the content of the thing it's just because everyone else thinks so so yeah, like maybe creativity is, is purely just a kind of social ranking function and nothing whatsoever to do with the entropy or the, the embeddingness. I don't totally agree with that because I, I don't like consensus like in, in creativity. Um, like I think consensus is, is anti-creative in some ways. So like if everybody agrees something is really cool, that's consensus. Um, and so those things matter, like things that we all agree on, like those can be 
actually um, valuable creative products. So there's no doubt about that. But the problem is that the, the process requires some things that not everybody agrees on to actually get to see the light of day also, because those are stepping stones to things that everybody agrees on. You know, I mean, it's often the case that like some major breakthrough came from somebody who did something that nobody agreed on. Um, so we need room for things that we don't agree on also, which is why we need a diversity of interestingness detectors. Like we don't want just one. Um, and this is like, yeah, this is why this is such a hard problem. There's not a universal sense of interestingness that we could actually formulate. I think it's, it's a, like a set. That's why I like population based. Like you mentioned, I like population based things. Like I, I, I'm, I'm suspicious of everything being point, put into one single convergent system. Um, even though that, that gets into really interesting questions about whether there could be such a like map, like a super brain that just encompasses everything that civilization does in one mind. Um, but I think even if it could theoretically exist, it would be incredible incredibly complex to actually construct compared to a population where there are actually like walls between different parts of it. Like that makes it a lot easier to have this bubbling up without consensus. Um, and so it's not that no one should care. You know, that's not the, like it's not like the most interesting things are things no one cares about. It's that there should there are different niches of expertise, like in different niches of uh you know, of aesthetic uh, preference. And like, they're all somehow good to have around because they flow into each other and then build on each other and then intersect with each other over time. Could, could, could I just touch on another? Because I, I agree with you that, um, so collaborative filtering, the way it's implemented, it's basically um, convergent. You know, it, it has a consensus mechanism. But, but then we were talking about whether it's about the content or the social validation. And it might, it might have sounded like I was saying, oh, it's completely arbitrary if it's social validation. But let's look at Carsonization. So like, you know, the, the independent um, morphological evolution of crab-like forms. Well, the reason why they independently converged in different places in the phylogeny is because they were just so physically well attuned and there could be a similar thing with um social validation that it could just be so finely socially attuned that that's the reason why these diverse clouds of memes exist and then maybe they kind of converge together later on but it still sort of maintains that diversity preservation that that you that you think is so important and i agree yeah that that, that, that could be i mean the the the, the independent discovery of similar motifs um like crustaceans um, is, yeah, it's, it, it is, it, it, there's an interpretation of that where it's because, uh, it's because, yeah, there, there, there's, there, it's a generally well adapted thing. And but, but I actually, because I, I usually don't like thinking about evolution in terms of adaptation. So that, that's why I struggle with that, because I, I understand the, the adaptation arguments for evolution, but I feel like a lot of the, the adaptation explanations are the explanations for the less interesting parts of it. Like I'm always interested in the divergent aspect of evolution. I want to know why does it diverge? And so if you only go with adaptive explanations, you're actually sort of like asking for convergence because it's like those are the things that work, whatever that means. So like that's where we should go. So it's like we should all converge to crustaceans eventually because it's such a well-adapted form. Um, and I think that like actually maybe another explanation of why you see all of those things like lots of different realizations of a similar theme it's just because it's easy to make it that could be it's it's actually an a priori like property of the search space that making stuff like that is just easy it follows from a lot of different paths so you'll just hit on it again and again because what we're doing is just illuminating everything that's possible over time um, and so we'll just see these things and some things are just more likely than others because representationally in DNA, they just happen to be uh, taking up more of the space, not necessarily because they're better or something in that way. Um, you know, because it's like, what is, is a crustacean better than a, than a single cell? Like, I don't, there's no really relative comparison there. They're both successful in their own right. Um, it's not an absolute uh, competition uh, over like the entire world. So, Kenneth, you, you just created this serendipity social network. Um, you know, wh why did you do it? Setting objectives can actually be bad for creative achievement, innovation, or even achieving the objective itself that you wanted to achieve. Um, it can get in the way because it closes your mind to all the other things that could lead in different directions that would actually be opportunistic for you. In other words, it can be deceptive to set an objective. And, and we, we did a lot of research in AI that showed this um, algorithmically. But then we wrote this book for general audiences, not AI audiences, although it was meant to be also interesting to AI audiences. But we were hoping other people could appreciate it because we started to believe Joel Lehman and I, my co-author, um, who worked on me with on Novelty Search, we started to believe that the lessons there 
aren't just algorithmic, but are actually social. Like, in other words, they apply to the way we run institutions, the way that people run their individual lives, the way we run educational systems, the way we run businesses and investment, like everything, because everything in this world is saturated in objectives, including, by the way, social networks are extremely objectively driven. Like they're based on maximization principles. You maximize likes or you maximize follows. You try to maximize exposure by maximizing attention, and then you get more and it's reinforced. It's very objective. And so it reflects a widespread ubiquitous culture, which is like worldwide, which is really interesting, um, which is just like we all believe in this idol of, of objectives, that it should guide everything that you do. And the book is arguing that there are other incentives and or other uh, gradients that you should follow, like especially interestingness, like not knowing where you're going to end up, but knowing that this path looks really interesting for independent reasons, because it opens up a whole new playground of possibilities, even though I don't know what the payoff will be, um, that that is very important to the advance of civilization, but it is not recognized in the way that we institutionalize everything that we do. And so like the algorithmic insight led to this like kind of social critique view. And that is why we wrote this book, because we wanted to we thought this is like a big problem. Like he's granting funding agencies run on objectives. Like that's probably the most salient thing for us because we were like researchers. So it's like when we have to ask for money to do research, we would have to ask, we would have to tell them what is our objective and we'd be evaluated based on the objective, whether it's worth, worth funding the research, which is completely backwards if what I'm saying is actually true, which I'm very confident that it's true. And so I wanted to convey that confidence to the world by writing it down and putting all the arguments in a book so everybody could see this. And then it applies to all kinds of things. It's not science funding. It's like investing. It's the way that we run the, the country, the way they run education, everything I said. So we wrote this book. And so this is the beginning of the story. So we wrote this book. And the book is old now. It's like eight and a half years old. But around when it was about seven years old, um, that's around where this, this, this idea started swirling in my head of like that we should, I should do this kind of uh, new kind of net social network. How did that lead to that? Well, the thing was that over the course of these seven years before I started feeling like I should do this, I was the, the thing that the book did, which might be an unintended consequence, was it created a situation where I became the worldwide focal point for people who don't like the fact that everything in the world is objectively driven. It's like I was the, the place you go to complain about the system. Um, and everybody thinks they're in this system. I mean, I shouldn't say everybody. Of course, there's some people who just like are invested in objectives. But actually, you'd be surprised how few that is. Like I thought at first the book would be very polarizing and that there'd be like these two sides and it'd be super controversial. But I rarely meet someone who really is willing to stick up for objectives. That's, that's actually quite unusual. So it's actually like the book seems to be a re relatively popular message that most people agree with. But it's very paradoxical because of the fact that a lot of the people who I talk to are people who are literally perpetuating this objective system and they actually hate it you know and so I started to realize this like but, but the reason that they perpetuate the system is because everybody feels like they're locked into it because of the next level up you know so you could talk to some somebody who's running like some you know some like billion dollar like government federal lab or something and they, they allocate money very objectively like to projects it, but but if I talk to that person they're like I hate the way this whole system works like we would love to change things like the way that your book describes but we answer to Congress, or we answer to an executive, or we answer to like our investors, or like it depends what organization is, but everybody feels like they answer to someone and that someone they answer to is objectively oriented. And so there's no way to just do something radical and just like tamp down, uh, tamp down those objectives. Um, and so, of course, um, you know, you, you, what I'm talking about is just tamping down. I'm not talking about eliminating objectives from the face of the earth. We can still we can we can we can split the difference to some extent. It's a, we need to move the pendulum a little bit in the other direction. Is all I'm saying. So it's just not like I'm saying like, get rid of all objectives. That that would be a kooky thing to say. Um, but like even moving the pendulum seems to be very hard. And so I got to meet people at all the levels, like at the top levels and the bottom levels. Everybody affected by this system, and they all hate it. They're all sick of it. And even in like their personal life, like, like they don't, they feel like they, they can't actually just do things because they want to just do them because they're fun or explore. Like they have to justify everything they do. This is particularly true of adults. You go, the far, the younger you go, the less this is true, which is one of the sad things. Like if you're five years old, this is not true. You just go to the playground and you do whatever you want. You don't care what it's going to do for payoff. Um, but this is basically sucked out of us over the course of our education because the education system is extremely objective. Um, and so, you know, I, I met people at all levels. You know, I met people from like, I would meet diverse 
walks of life and also diverse age groups. Um, like I meet people like artists and doctors and retirement planners and military planners. Like I met such a diversity of people, but I met everything, you know, from like the most senior person to like a 14 year old high school student. Um, and like the 14 year old actually I met because his grandmother found me from hearing some of my stuff and, 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 and asked me if I would come talk to her kid because he's too obsessed with objectives to her grandson. Um, and that was just, like really surprising you know like each one of these things is like a revelation for me as an expert because it's like you wouldn't expect an ai researcher to have experiences like this it's like a therapy session i mean these, these people came into my office and we had therapy basically i i you know i, I basically snapped them out of the objective fi fixation um and it was really interesting to me too to, to experience that like to see like what it does to somebody because you're really changing someone's life in 30 minutes um and that's really fundamentally interesting and so after experiencing these kinds of things over years, like seven years of this, you can imagine this is like messing with my head in a way which is different than like AI research. It's like a parallel life I was living. Um, I was seeing that like, you know, there's a huge demand for a more serendipitous world. Because like what we're really talking about here is serendipity. Um, you know, because when you talk about good things happening that aren't planned because you don't have the objective when you get to them, that's like the definition of serendipity is unplanned greatness, basically, which is, you know, it's not a surprise. The book is called Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. Um, and so, like, I think what people really wanted was more opportunity for serendipity. You know, a lot of people argue that serendipity is random. So for a lot of people, that'd be a non-starter from a business perspective because you can't package randomness, like sell it to people. But the thing is that... Um, I believe because of my all of my research and all the things I've been doing, to me, serendipity is not random. Like that's a very important thing. Serendipity is is something that that is that can be increased in probability by increasing the number of stepping stones that you collect in your life or the number of stepping stones that we collect as a society. This jumping off points that are interesting. The more you have at your disposal that you've been exposed to, the more places you can get, which means you're more likely to experience serendipity. That's why some people seem so much more luckier than others. It's not just an accident. Like they've put themselves out there, collected more stepping stones. They've basically increased their serendipity surface so that it's more likely something chance will happen that's interesting. Um, and this is why, by the way, like if you go to Wikipedia and you look at like the serendipity Wikipedia page, Page, your serendipitous invention page there's a book on uh, sorry there's a page on this like serendipitous invention it has like a whole list of like inventions from people that were serendipitous you know like the microwave you know was invented because somebody like walked by like a radar device and it like melted a candy bar in his pocket and and, and what's really interesting about it is that if it was true that serendipity was random those would all be just totally random people but they're all really smart, really accomplished people, like across the board. Like that doesn't make any sense if this is a random process. Smart people have a more of an opportunity to be exposed to something. Um, and by smart, I, you know, I don't mean conventional smart. I just mean people who actually do things that are interesting, uh, which isn't necessarily conventional IQ or something like that. Um, those people have just more chance, more chance. Um, and so serendipity is not random. And so coming from that perspective, I started thinking we should be able to do something about this. Like everybody is so unhappy with the way that the world works, um, you know, from my experience over years. And I'm like, well, wait a second. You know, for a while I was thinking, well, this, this is all a reaction to social critique, but it's not because it's a reaction to algorithms because the book is not a philosophical book. The book was based in concrete algorithms and empirical results which had nothing to do with philosophy. Like they were just things that I was exploring for algorithmic purposes. They're totally concrete things that were actually implemented and led to these conclusions. And so when I started thinking about this, um, like, a, like, a, like a year and a half ago, when the book was seven years old, I started to feel like that it, it, because it comes from algorithms, it should be able to, to swing this back to algorithms. Like there should be a systematic way to construct a world that works the way it should work because everybody's so unhappy with the way the world works. And so I started trying to think like, what could that possibly be? What does that even mean? But then it was the first thing I thought was, well, it's going to be it's going to be on the Internet because I can't algorithmatize uh, like the world itself. So something has to be different about the internet, like the internet could work in a different way. So then I was like, oh, it's just a network. It's some kind of new, new kind of a network which exposes people to stepping stones in this more open-ended way, which is like inspired by open-ended algorithms. It's inspired by things like a novelty search or minimal criterion types of algorithms, um, poet, like it's inspired by these kind of insights we've had over the years. Um, and, um, 
And, and then it could be wrapped around people through a network um, to make the world work that way. So then I thought, oh, that's a serendipity network. That's like a cool idea, a serendipity network. It's like a, a thing you could imagine. But then the next thing I realized, which is is that, well, obviously, like within a second, I realized that's a new kind of social network. Because as soon as you connect people in a network and it's information moving back and forth among people, like that, that's basically a, a social network. So a serendipity network is a social network. Um, but what's so fascinating about it, at least to me at the time, is that the trajectory of thought that leads to this has absolutely nothing to do with social networks up to that point. It's a totally independent trajectory of thinking. Like social networks has this whole history of decades now of thinking about mechanisms and stuff to increase engagement and blah, blah, blah. And that's why we have likes and follows and it's super objective. And it reflects the, the overriding prevailing objective culture we live in. It's like just that started to seem really interesting to me that this is just another angle of the same culture that we're seeing that we all accept and assume is normal because it's been beaten into us that everything has to be objective that just seems natural but it doesn't have to be that way um and so i i started to think the serendipity network is a counterpoint that's like really interesting sorry see, see you have something in your mind people presumably see this differently so some people have come up to you saying i really hate the way society is run and, and you were giving the example of creatives and artists and a, a lot of that is because it's it's not possible to quantify what they're doing but i i, I like the lens mm -hmm. of agency so what you're basically saying is um, you want to live in a high agency society. And that's because the more agency you have, the more serendipity you have, the more stepping stones you collect. And then it becomes a political thing, right? So people on the left, they don't think we have any agency. And people on the right, they, they want a high agency society. The reason they don't want a government is because what does a government do? It erodes your agency. It's, it's kind of like a agency eroding. Well, uh, you know, it's, that's, that is an interesting point that, that I have not, I've rarely addressed the connection of any of this to politics. It has come up in some rare occasions, actually, but very rarely. Like, it's come up because there are specific cases that have happened where somebody very political did come to me uh, excited because they thought the book justified their point of view. Um, and in some cases, it was people who I totally disagree with their political point of view. But it was really interesting <laughs> to me that, that they, they, they saw the book as sort of empowering to them. Um, and I've seen that on both sides. Um, and so uh, rarely have I discussed this, though. Um, and I, I want to point out, though, that like it, it is the book is very apolitical because of the fact that I see this on both sides. But if you really dig into this, you know, I think what you just did by 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 putting agency as sort of like the the, the abstraction of what I'm saying you you succeeded in couching this in a way that that would potentially bias people one way or another politically so you've basically just pushed it to the right um but i don't think that that's what people usually do um that's your interpretation of it not 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 to the right necessarily i think it's more of a um the the words authority and paternalist uh, paternalism and autocracy mm -hmm. so it, in a in a company we run companies in a very autocratic paternalistic way we have, you know, like big corporations have um, lots of ethics boards and, you know, policy boards. And the, and the, I think the justification is it's about control and alignment. And even with Facebook, for example, that there's there's power seeking behavior. And the way you gain power is well, the way you subjugate people is by taking away their agency to give you more agency. But you see yeah. this on the left so and I, right. Yeah. So on, on, on the left, you, 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 you get kind of like, you know. Um, you might be uh, um, like Chomsky, an anarcho-syndicalist, and, and you want a diffusion of agency, or you might be uh, yeah. like Mao or Stalin or whatever, and, and want to have like you know you, you don't want anyone to have yeah, any agency. Yeah. So I think you see it on both sides. Yeah, that, that's that's right. Yeah, I think you see you see agency deprivation on both sides, um, <laughs> and so, so like you can interpret you can interpret you know, the, the book with respect to agency as, as sort of an argument against whatever side you want, I think, um, you know, because like, yeah. it's true that, you know, like, I, I've, I've heard this more right leaning argument, like, like in that, that sort of like the book seems to enable um, that, like, there's a lot of like belief in top down planning that like, is like sort of leftist kind of belief that like, you just have the government plan everything. And, and that this book sort of like disabuses all of this, this is really great. 
But on the other hand, like from, from the left side, like you have this idea that like exploration is extremely important in life, you know, and you think about like things like youthful exploration and it, it involves like doing things that you actually want to do, um, which could involve things like doing drugs. It could involve things uh, like having partners in different forms that aren't necessarily socially sanctioned in the, in the, in the way that people on the right necessarily want them to be. Um, and so you feel this kind of like also attempt to kind of like control autonomy coming from the other side. Um, and so, you know, and it's true, like if you go to either extreme, like obviously like you can have dictatorships on the left or the right or autocracy. Um, and then you get a lot of control in a lot of different ways, but it's a different kinds of control because there's different, different kinds of political dis inclinations there. Um, that I think I want, I would like this book in this point to be totally apolitical because I don't think it has to do with any particular political movement. Um, I think, all of us can agree on this, which is rare, that we all want to be able to explore things that are interesting. Um, and it's true. We have to put limitations yeah. on that. That is true. That, that's what society needs to do. And I think every side would agree that some limitations are necessary somewhere, but we can, we can disagree on what those limitations are, and that's left versus right. But the general point that we want to maximize our autonomy and ability to explore is still important, I think. And we can then go on to interpret it politically in terms of what those restrictions should be. Yes, yeah. And uh, I wrote an article recently and I was talking about the strange bedfellows um, in, in in the free energy principle. But that was just that you get people on the right who are, I don't know, they believe in crypto and decentralization and, and so on. And, and you would actually think that these people are arguing for, you know, agency maximization. But the interesting thing, though, is that when you look at the behavioral complexity of the sphere of the left and the right, all of the complexity is actually on the left. The left has this tendency to infinitely fractionate and kind of produce entropy. And there's a famous saying that the left eats itself. And that, that's kind of like, <laughs> you know, almost saying that they're, they're spending more time infinitely kind of um, slicing and dicing them up and creating complexity, whereas the right is, is yeah, very yeah. Um, monolithic yeah. and homogenous. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I could see that. I mean, you know, in like, like the concept of a social experiment, like, you know, the, the left sometimes wants to do social experiments. This is actually exploration. It might be interesting. It actually yeah. might be bad, but it could be interesting. Um, and and the, the, the disagreements come with this idea of where to put the constraints, you know, because I think we should all agree. I mean, algorithmically, I totally agree that open-ended systems need to be constrained. Like there's some things you can't actually invest in. They're too dangerous to invest in. So we just won't go there. Um, and, you know, even evolution has that. Like, that's why some lineages stop. They basically have run into the constraints of the, of the physical world. Um, and so it's a question of what the constraints should be is really the, the, the political debate. Um, and I mean, obviously, in, in, in open ends goes beyond politics because if you're building an algorithm, it's generally not a political issue. Well, it's becoming one because AI is becoming political. Um, but a lot of the time, you just wanted the algorithm to do what you wanted to do. And it's nothing to do with politics. But these issues still come up. If it's going to be open ended, it's going to explore, if it's going to be creative, and it's a creative algorithm, then you're going to deal with what the restrictions should be. It's just not really political in that case. It has some, it's just more of an algorithmic question. But constraints just come up and, and we really fight with each other a lot about them. Um, but I've been, I've been extremely happy that the book has remained effectively apolitical um, because it allows it to make a general point that doesn't just get everybody, that we don't immediately form sides on. Like I, that's something I really would like to avoid because it hasn't done that yet. Um, like we, we, we tend to like, can't, to like form camps immediately around every issue. You know, you don't, you can't, it happens like lightning fast. It's like COVID happens, like everybody's on one side or another. <laughs> it's like, a, instantly like we're all mad about one thing but like here like it hasn't happened and i feel very happy about that because it's a social point that we could actually rally around here no matter what side we're on in politics because not really a political point you know d deep in your core deep in your core why did you do this thing uh well i, I think I, so yeah deep in my core uh the, the 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 well there's a number of things um it's even though it looks on the face of it like this is not a, a natural thing for me to do. Like I remember somebody when, when I first tweeted about Maven, like somebody said, wow, I never would have expected him to do that. Um, and I can see that if I simulate what people would think I would do. But the thing is that it actually really follows very naturally from who I am, because I've always been interested in these kinds of divergent systems. And like the ultimate divergent system is the world itself and the people in it. It's the people in it who do the surprising things, who invent the things. It's to facilitate that in the real world is like the sort of ultimate 
extreme of like investigating open-ended systems, even though it isn't just pure AI, because obviously if there's people in it, then it's the eyes coming from the people and the system. So it's not, it's not only people, there's a system too that's like connecting those people in an intelligent way, which is drawing from insights in AI, but it's not just pure AI research. But for me, it's basically an extension to the extreme of like, let's do the ultimate open-ended experiment you could possibly do today. Um, and so in that sense, it's like really invigorating for me, like experimentally. But also the thing that really appealed to me, which is deep, I think is deep in my core, is that I was um, like everybody, I was starting to feel the, um, the, the, the social implications of AI more strongly, um, like in the last couple of years. Um, and like as somebody who's been around a little longer, um, like for a couple of decades in this field, I, um, I, I, I was used to not that not being part of it, you know, like, so, so it might be more shocking for me, like someone growing up in AI today might, might be less shocked and just, this is kind of like the way the field is. But for me, it was a, it was more like just like a playground where like, people were friendly and doing intellectual stuff. Like it wasn't like this you know, polarizing political issue, like where's AI going to go? So when that started to hit, you know, around the, the time of GPT and then jet chat GPT just exacerbates it, you know, large language models. And, the, and, and then the image generators too, and, and like a very uh, strong political ideology start to grow up around it um, and concerns and worries about things like ethics and safety and so forth. It was complicated, you know, to, to square that with the way I'd thought about it before. And it made me feel uneasy, I would say, um, because suddenly things that had just been really for fun, it became like really serious in my mind. Um, and I... I hadn't really grappled through like what exactly I think because it's hard to really conclude on some of these things like what should we do it's very complex so like unlike a lot of people who seem to immediately take like certitude style of views I, I just like take a long time to decide what I think um, on uh, complicated topics like this so I was like not really in a camp exactly but just really trying to understand um, and I just felt like I would just like to do something that's just like clearly socially virtuous like that it isn't ambiguous in this way for a little while uh well i don't really know what's right or wrong um and it just seemed like that like doing something to make you know humans and the way that they interact with each other more human is just like an obvious virtuous thing to do for the world it might not work i mean i i, I admit that like I, I could be wrong about how it's gonna work or it could it could fail or it could even like succeed in a bad way where it's actually unintended consequences overwhelm it but at least what i'm trying to achieve to do something to facilitate uh, communication that's different that's serendipitous rather than popularity and attention driven i feel very confident that that's a good thing it's a good thing to be involved in and it uses ai and it's open-ended so it's just still using the things that i think about and so it just seemed like such a good fit for the moment, like to actually like take AI and just do something that's nice. And um, and then it just puts all the things together that I care about. And the only downside to it is that it's ridiculously ambitious and likely to fail. But other than that, it's a really, really good thing to try. Quick point on that, because a way of reframing what you're what you're saying is that living in a, a agency amplifying society where people can do what they want to do without being stuck <clears throat> in the orbit of other people and that will have the effect as you were saying of increasing the behavioral complexity and diversity of knowledge and diversity of everything diversity of stepping stones in our society you're making the the kind of the statement that that is a virtuous thing to do like that that is what we want but in simple terms why is that a good thing yeah, right. Thanks for asking that. Um, yeah, I want to be more clear about that, you know, because just increasing like serendipity surface is a kind of an abstract concept. Um, it's I, I think it's cool. And, and there's probably some people listening who think it's cool to think about like a more open ended type of network or something like that. We have more discovery, more diversity, more divergence of thought. But like, why is that virtuous is the question. And when it comes to being virtuous, it's because it's a counterpoint to all the other stuff that's going on on the internet and social media. Um, and like all that, it, it's sort of um, a coincidence because that wasn't what was motivating me. Um, like when I like thought about this at first, you know, it's more, more the, the kind of like, oh, why greatness cannot be planned and stuff like that. But, but like once the idea came into my head, it was obvious that it is a counterpoint to a lot of stuff that is not virtuous right now. Um, and it's because of what is social media doing to us 
in our heads and doing to our society has become um, like a rallying cry, like again, across left and right. Like everybody sees that there are problems here. They may disagree on the problems to some extent, but we all recognize some of these problems universally, um, which are just bad for us. Like, and, and they, they span uh, like a really wide range from like just mundane things, like the fact that you just spent hours of your day addicted to something when you could have been doing something else to like much more dangerous things like disruption of democratic processes and things like that. Um, and, and you've got things like clickbait and you've got things like flame wars and you've got misinformation and you've got lots of things, but toxicity that like make you feel similar to, to me. It's like after, if you just like couldn't stop eating a big chocolate cake and just ate the whole thing in one sitting, it, it's just like you, you feel a little sick after you consume that feed, like the doom scrolling. Um, and we, we all recognize it and describe it in different ways. You know, it's not the same for all of us, the way we see the problem, but I think we all know that there's some kind of problem here. And I think I've come to conclude that the reason there is this problem is that it is the unintended consequences of the deceptive objective. Like we think that having an, the objective of maximizing likes and maximizing follows is a, a steady path to the ultimate best thing that you should be exposed to. Like that's the search process is we're going to get consensus and we're going to show you the thing that's the most important of the day. And that that is actually, that is actually a coherent thing to be doing, that that gradient actually makes sense. But it's a complex system and this is deceptive. And so we, we are seeing all of this stuff that makes us feel pathological is because actually that objective does not make any sense. It is a deceptive objective, like all other deceptive objectives. And what I could do is help us to yeah. uh, escape that and have a different alternative way for the world to work. One reading is it's just the wrong objective. It's a deceptive objective. So we're trying to create a, a system which is a high fidelity representation of how the world works. Mm -hmm. But Facebook have got this deceptive objective that just brings out all the worst in us. And, you know, I think I think we intuitively know that it makes us unhappy. But is it because of the erosion of agency? Is it because of the particular deceptive objective? I mean, I guess there's a thought experiment where what if it was a different objective, which was more closely aligned to how humans work? So is it the lack of agency or is it that particular deceptive objective which is causing the harm? Well, it's it's a really complicated topic, obviously, because the the implications of the objective are, are really multifaceted. So it's not like there's just like one thing that this this relates to. Um, it's multidimensional. And so um, there, there are some good things about it, you know, like I, I, it's not like all ubiquitous bad news, like there's some good things about social media. In fact, like, I would not advocate a world where everybody just shifted over to Maven and just dropped all the other social media. Like, I don't, I don't think that's good either, because it accomplishes some things that actually are good. Like, for example, like, I think it's useful for getting announcements out. Um, like, if you want to reach an audience, and you have an important thing to say, and it's the people who care about the things you say, then this is very convenient that you have this megaphone, which is provided by the, these systems that maximize follows and attention and things like that. Um, but it doesn't work for most people, you know, because it's very a tiny, tiny elite minority who have the megaphone. Like those are the people who've attracted all the attention. And then the perverse incentive of it is that getting attention requires you to do things that I think like relates to what you're saying reduces agency. You know, because like if you were really just being yourself, you wouldn't do those things. You, you wouldn't do those things in public even. Like you're doing things that are actually embarrassing um, and people are doing it every day because your agency is reduced, because you're responding strongly to these powerful incentives, these incentives are like surprisingly powerful. Like I don't think anybody would have known, including the founders of these services, how, how powerful just a like is on the human psyche. But it's like, it's a truly like, you know, hardcore drug um, and it can get you to do crazy things. Um, and so like, I don't, you know, at first I think they might've sincerely thought this will actually lead to better content. Like that's like the, the key here. We need a differentiator to know what's good. And this is so easy. Like you just have pr some press a button and then we can like get consensus. And it's, it's not like this is some like maniacal plan to control the world um, but like it has it, it turns out it's like a really powerful drug and it's reducing agency you know so like it's from everything from the fact that like you know you've got people you respect who are just like driveling with clickbait um, which is embarrassing at some level because they, they're just responding to the fact that's what they need to do to get a megaphone um, to things that I think are like more on the humorous level which is that like something I didn't realize is that like the truly 
pinnacle achievement in the world for like the, the like the most the most accomplished person you could ever imagine would be to just have one little quote in one of those books of like famous sayings like that's what people really want they just want to be like you know when they, you, you, you hear a quote of george washington or something they just want their name as beside that with their little pithy quote and you see these these like wannabe sages every day with their pearls of wisdom like driveling out onto the internet it's somehow like even though they're like like the most famous people in the world they have like a nobel prize but they just got to keep yeah. letting you know, like, I've got really interesting things to say. <laughs> that is not normal behavior. Like, this is all responding to, like, this really deceptive, this really deceptive objective. Um, and in some ways, a little embarrassing, because to me, it diminishes the greatness in some way to see people acting like that. Like, I would think they're, like, above it in a way. Like, these are these are the great role models of our time. Um, and, and they're acting in this way because it shows we're all just human. Um, or, or at least I would have thought they were. And so I, I think, you know, like all of this is, is a reduction. And then another thing that reduces our agency is this, like the mundane fact that I would like to pursue things I'm curious about, but I don't feel like I can. That's clearly a lack of agency. Like when I tweet or something, you know, I have enough followers that it could be useful to tweet something because I can reach a number of people. Um, and so... But I, because of that, I feel like I can't tweet certain things um, because I know what their expectations are. It's like I'm a brand. That's why everybody talks about personal branding. I mean, what a disgusting idea to brand your own self. But this is like considered just like normal stuff now, like everybody's branding themselves. And you can't avoid it because you're going to lose if you don't, you know, like because I, I might have some interest in washing machines or something, but I'm not going to I'm not going to start talking to my followers about that. Like that's not what they expect from me. It's going to be total disappointment. And I know I don't know what I'm talking about, too. So like part of my like, you know, brand is that I know what I'm talking about, like everybody else. So if I start saying things that are like way off base and ridiculous, you know, I'm just diminishing my brand. And it's like, actually, the guy's an idiot. And so I'm embarrassed and I don't want to do that. But I actually might be curious about these things. Like, where can I go to just talk about things I'm curious about? It's actually really interesting that I can't do it there. Then you've got this huge population, 99.9% .9 who don't have enough followers that they even could get their message out and are like totally disempowered and have no agency at all. Um, you know, they, they actually have interesting things to say. Not all of them, but a lot of them do, obviously, um, because some of them don't even want to play that game. That's why they don't have their megaphone, but they still might have something interesting to say. Where can they go? So I think all of us have a really diminished agency in this like totally deceptive, objective culture, um, which I think is, yeah. is like a really cool opportunity it would be virtuous to fix that i'm not saying that i know i can fix it you know I, I you know i'm like this savior like figure like that's not what i think i'm just saying it's worth trying to do something about this that is virtuous to just yeah. try to try to create a real alternative yeah that was that was beautiful but yeah just to comment on what you said it's so true. I mean, um, what, what's even more interesting is how quickly it's become received wisdom and accepted by everyone. Like um, LinkedIn, for example, they're giving out these top voice badges and people are now, you know, it's their full time job to be the marketing department for open AI. So every time a new model gets released, they'll use GPT and they'll generate a press release. And um, and then they've become a top voice on LinkedIn. And I always thought that YouTube was quite immune to this because YouTube does actually, <clears throat> you know, um, it optimizes for satisfaction and you get some very interesting long form content but what little did I know the more I learn about YouTube the realize that the more I realize how debased and deranged it is because you start learning about thumbnail optimization and clickbait titles and how important the first five seconds are yeah, and how yeah. you're doing this psychological manipulation and actually just look at all the popular videos on on YouTube and it's just garbage it's just debasement and and also it's 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 debasing our behavior it's lowering our moral standards in in many ways and all sorts of weird stuff oh, like that and nobody yeah. notices yeah, can I add to that? Because um, there, there's, yeah. there's also an interesting thing about that, like YouTube, when you think about that, that intuitively you would think that it would contribute to, uh, like in, in, in other places we've talked about, like open-endedness and how it contributes to the continued march of civilization, like more diversity, more divergence of ideas, more interesting things going on. So you would think YouTube is like going to absolute like poor rocket fuel on that like that's what i would expect and to, yeah. to a little extent you see pockets of this like you do see certain new stepping stones that you wouldn't have seen before because there's such a vast amount of like opportunity now to reach an audience with something that hasn't really been tried before um but 
somehow something about culture also seems broken at the same time, you know, because like wh where are all the new musical genres that used to happen? Like they don't seem to be happening anymore. Um, like, like things seem to have stopped somewhere around the year 2000 a lot. Like I was, you know, I was saying like that, like in rock music used to have like a new form, like every like t 10 or 20 years, like what, what happened? Like the radio sounds exactly the same as it did 25 years ago. Um, yes. And like, I think part of it is that, this is another side effect of these kinds of objective driven algorithms. These are convergent algorithms. The, the like aggregate effect over decades with millions of people is incredibly hard to understand or digest. But I think yeah, we are yeah. actually seeing the aggregate effect now that like it's actually causing a kind of like slowdown of cultural progress um, and convergence to like already agreed upon standards. That is just like really deleterious to, to, to cultural and probably other types of progress that otherwise would be happening. That's so true. I mean, you could argue that it's a kind of continuation of globalization in general, but we've certainly seen this in, in the UK. So we used to have quite a distinct culture and since even since MTV and, and cable TV and so on, but even more so since YouTube, there's just this global monoculture now. And I completely agree with you that all of the interesting diversity preservation has gone and everything's just becoming the same um, slave to the algorithms and all that. So, yeah, it's... Um, it's really interesting. The other thing I wanted to comment on is even things like um, our search engine and our infosphere. Um, if you think about it, where's all the new information coming from? So like now we're using things like perplexity or we're using retrieval augmented generation on top of the search results. So no one's looking at the search results anymore. No one's looking at the individual pages and they're kind of cannibalizing each other. And now we're producing this thing where there's, there's no fresh information <clears throat> to build a search index anymore. Right. So we just kind of yeah. like feed, you know, gar um, garbage in, garbage out. And, and we're kind of eating our own yeah. poop to a certain extent. So um, yeah, it, yeah. it almost feels yeah. like there's going to be a mode collapse of, of all of the information. And the reason for that is, as you said, we now have um, an entropy and agency minimizing society, which is the complete opposite of what yeah. we need. Yeah, yeah. It's like ultimately it's a kind of a permission not to think is what it creates, yeah. like to think for yourself. Because yep. everything's been ranked and everything's been already classified and there's already mass consent. Like, how can you disagree with a million people? Um, it's like it's already consensus. Like, it's just you, you come in and you're like, this must be the best thing. And of course, you, you still have your own brain and you can still be like, ah, I didn't really like that, even though everybody else seems to like it. But the truth is, it's having a massive effect on you. Um, like with the fact that every single thing that like comes out, even like a single sentence that somebody tweets out, like in the middle of a conversation, is ranked. It's that's insane. Could you imagine if that was like happening while you're at the dinner table? It's like you're having a conversation, like numbers appear above people's heads while they're talking, like to see who says the best thing to say. It would totally distort you. I mean, you, you would you would be mentally deranged from something like that. But that is what's happening. Um, that that's the way we experience the world on, on every level, from like like a like a big new movie to like a single sentence on. On, on, on X and it's just a it's it's just, it's a crazy pathological perversion of human nature, um, which is which is being just just totally like like forced upon us, um, and so so yeah like the the idea like some people can't even imagine there's an alternative world. It's weird because like 25 years ago there was an alternative world like this stuff didn't even exist. Like I used to socialize. I think so. I had social. I had social. Uh, social experiences, and there were no like buttons. And but now it's like, well, what? There is no such thing as a like a social network without a like button. Like, what the heck does it even mean? That's that is what social is. But there are alternative worlds, and I think, um, you know, I I feel like it's possible to to pursue one. Um, in my case, like the problem is, it's really dangerous to, to pursue them because they seem crazy. It's like, if you just said, oh, well, Facebook would be better if you got rid of the like button, if you got rid of reactions, you get rid of following your friends. And, but it's like, that's better. Like what, what is that? Like, that's the whole premise of the whole system. Like I will not be able to sell that to Mark Zuckerberg. He won't do that. Um, and so like, that's not, that is so dangerous that that's why I think nobody's trying any alternatives because it sounds crazy. But the reason that I feel like I'm empowered to actually do something radical like that is because I came to the conclusion and the framework for it, not by trying to undo what already exists, 
but just a completely independent trajectory of thinking. Like, I have nothing to do with all that stuff. I wasn't trying to get rid of it. I was just thinking about how serendipitous systems work. I was working on open-ended algorithms for decades. Um, like, I just have a trajectory of thought that's just totally independent, and it just leads me to a point which happens to be different. And that's a reason that it isn't crazy. Like, it actually comes from things. It's not just I'm just trying to overturn the status quo. Because those kind of that kind of radicalism often is just like doomed for failure, but I have like a, just a different set of thinking, and so like I think that that gives some hope that like an alternative world could exist, um, and it's worth a try, you know, worth a try to to give this alternative and, and see what that might actually be like. It feels to me that human beings must be better than chess computers, and we just don't know yet. We haven't proven it yet because human beings have creativity and chess computers don't. So presumably there is something a human could conceivably do that would break the chess machine. We just haven't found it yet. And what, you, you know, my read on what you're saying there is that there's almost no scale when it comes to creativity. If you're doing something creative, one thing which is creative isn't necessarily better than another thing. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Like, it's totally true. You know, it's like when we talk about evolution and we talk about fitness, we think of it as like this absolute measure that like helps us to understand like why something survives, why something doesn't. But think about it like when you think about creativity, like think about it like be between like very disparate species, it's like a meaningless thing to talk about. You know, like the fitness of a of bacteria versus the fitness of a human being. It's like what do we even mean? Like maybe we can mean that like the, the bacteria actually reproduces at a much faster rate. And actually any given bacteria has many more offspring than any given human. Like there's different ways we could talk about. So they're winning. I don't know if you want to put it that way. They have more higher fitness than actually in absolute numbers. They also would. There's like way more bacteria than humans on the face of the earth. Uh, but what's the point of this comparison? Like, it's the creative aspect is actually the interesting. It's like we're, we're missing the forest for the trees. We're trying to be extremely objective. And of course, you generally wouldn't talk about bacteria versus humans in that way because it would be ridiculous. But we do that with content, um, which is ridiculous. Um, because like the actual interesting thing is the creative component, not some superficial stuff like how many bacteria can you count in the world? Um, and so it's like these, these like more, these orthogonal dimensions, like what humans actually do in their lifetime and stuff like that, that makes it worth caring about us, even though we don't actually have as much biomass on the world in total. And so, yeah, it gets silly at some level in creative, very creative domains or when you care about creativity to try to be extremely objective to make decisions about what we should focus on, what we should not focus on. Um, and if you think about it, like the entire social media world works that way. I just wondered whether you could bring in the, the market system and the profit motive here, because you could argue that even in a corporation where the central goal is to make profit, there is still, even though it's a constrained space, there is still an infinite number of instrumental sub goals that would lead to the company making more money. So, you know, the, the whole greatness cannot be planned idea is that we should be discovering new stepping stones and the and the uh, the powers that be in the company shouldn't necessarily be eroding your agency and telling you what not to do. But in a purely creative pursuit or, or even maybe in a serendipity social network, there really is no grounding principle at all. Yeah, I, I mean, it's very true that corporations also face this issue. I mean, because of the fact creativity reoccurs in, over and over again in many, many different situations. And I mean, you can go from evolution to social networks to corporations, like it's just a ubiquitous issue. Um, and so, yeah, like even in corporations, like you will have a lot of convergence, obviously, if you have a single objective guiding the entire corporation and you'll, you'll wipe out things like research labs. I mean, you can't have them. They won't be doing research, at least you could call it a research lab. But if they're all basically subservient to the bottom line, it's not actually a research lab. Because research means you have to do things that actually are not necessarily guided by the final or ultimate short-term objective, and that's um, or even long-term objective. We need to be independent of objectives in order to explore interesting paths, and that's a way of preventing disruption. You know, that's why it's strategically important, even though it may seem like it's off-path. You know, because it's like, what do, what do we really care about, and other than the bottom line, if this is about profit. But the thing is that like you won't be having any profits anymore if you're disrupted. And disruption comes from unpredictable areas, and it's not just about optimizing along the path that you're on. Um, so to prevent disruption, you need some ability to look outside, and that means, yeah, not caring only about a quality maximization principle. And then, of course, that crosses over, like you say, into 
social media really strongly because there isn't even a profit motive to a large extent. I mean, there has become a lot of profit motive. I mean, there's a lot of people who are using their brands to make money on social media. Um, but like from the point of view of the aggregate system or just an end user who's just trying to experience something interesting, what does profit even matter? It has nothing to do with what you're getting out of this thing, um, which is partly why Maven is such a risk risky endeavor. Um, but it, this is this is uh, going to be um, arguably better for for like the end user to just be exposed to more interesting things for them based on what they are interested in, um, and get away from the maximization principle that sort of guides everything in the world. Yeah, and we were saying before, because you could take a cynical um, take on this, but but you convinced me before that serendipity is a natural thing. Because you could argue that, for example, I can go and set up a YouTube channel and actually serendipity is instrumental to power seeking or me wanting to be famous or, or whatever. But it, it comes back to this notion of agency. And I want to I want to try one, one more time with this, because I, I just think it's so powerful as a lens to kind of think about some of some of the things you, you speak about. And I think of agency as a thing with preferences or, or volition, which uh, successfully shapes the world around it to match its preferences. So that's kind of what I think of as, as agency. And I think it's really related to power mm -hmm. seeking. So for example, one of the reasons why things want to shape the world around them is because they want to kind of commandeer or even steal agency away from the things around them. And then there's this notion that, um, you know, innovation in a sense or in its essence is quite heretical, right? So, you know, there was this story of, uh, uh, I think, Giordano Bruno um, in the sort of uh, the 16th century in Florence or Rome or whatever. Um, he thought that the stars that we see at night are actually quite similar to the sun and, you know, they might have their own planets and even suggested that the universe is infinite and, uh, you know, there could be no celestial body um, at its centre. And he was burned at the stake in 1600, mm. right? So, you know, there's, there's a saying that science advances one funeral at a time. But I, I think the reason he was burned at the stake was because such an idea would diminish the agency of the Catholic Church and similarly, you know, when um, this Einsteinian relativity was doing the rounds in the 1920s, even though Newton died hundreds of years ago, there were still people who were kind of like sequestering power and agency just being on the orbit in the orbit of the legacy of Newton. So presumably they were writing books and reputations were made and so on. And, and as soon as you kind of tear down that myth, all of their power dissipates. So that there seems to be like a real power dynamic to this as well. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and it's, uh, I mean, we become invested in uh, whatever has given us success or where we've staked our career, where we've built our reputation. I mean, it makes sense that that, that would matter a lot to people. And people tend to have staked their reputation in the previous paradigm. I mean, it's basically always the case. I mean, the next paradigm hasn't happened yet. Um, and so when somebody comes around with a new paradigm, it's a threat to everybody. It's a threat to everybody with how they've staked their careers. And so it's, it's going to be heretical, um, intrinsically heretical. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you, you can see uh, like growing consensus around certain paradigms like large language models like today. Um, and of course, there's always going to be, you know, some some people, some cranks that are, you know, snipping at the side and saying like, oh, we, you know, that we're going to get rid of LLMs or something like that. But those aren't really the things that are a threat. I mean, it's more like if somebody really has something creative to say, it's like totally out out there, then it's a threat. And then we would expect um, there's going to be an immune reaction <laughs> to protect the status quo. Um, it's a problem. I mean, you see that in, I mean, that definitely happens in like, you know, the way grant review happens like that. Like you're reviewed by your peers, but your peers generally represent the status quo. So, um, of course, it makes it hard to get anything through uh, like a like a grant committee um, to get funded if it is truly heretical. Like how can you fund something heretical? Um, and um, it's, it's just a big problem with uh, the way that, you know, our, our objective based way of working. Like, like if you, we try to imagine systems that actually can function around um, assessing heresy uh, in like a productive way, that's like not the way anybody's really thought about the system. I mean, because like obviously some heresies are, are, are actually a waste of time. There's no question about that. Um, but like sorting between which are and which aren't is, is not really anything anybody's concerned with officially. 
Um, and so that that's just like it isn't a really great function that we have right now. And I see the connection to agency and power seeking. Um, yeah, because like it's, it gives you power uh, to be connected to the status quo. Um, and uh, yeah, you can build a career in the status quo. Uh, so that's that's going to be that that's that's an maybe unfortunate side effect of of actually discovering things. It creates power and then be, people get invested and then they become entrenched. The, the last year's heretic is now like, you know, today's dictator. So um, it's just a, a cycle that it's uh, hard to get out of because we're humans. Yeah, but um one interesting take, though, is that, I mean, first of all, there are many degrees of freedom when it comes to agency and power seeking. So just uh, the agency to read the kind of books I want to read is a kind of power or, or dominion over my intellectual life. Mm. And there are some things we, I mean, even like murdering someone, for example, we, we technically have the agency to do that, but we wouldn't because there'd be consequences. So there, there's all of these kind of conditioning forces and, and so on. Okay, let's see. Is any serendipitous process a form of power seeking? I, I mean, the um, it, that is, that sounds cynical, but let's, let's see, does it make any sense? Um, so, you know, cause I, I do think that, um, without, without that point, without you making that point, I would have said that, you know, serendipity is one of the more pure types of motivations. If, if you can call it a motivation that like, you know, so just doing things cause you're curious, um, just exploring the world or something like that. Um, it's not like intrinsically trying to figure out how to gain power in the world because trying to explicitly gain power is, is an objective type of thing. I mean, that would be your objective then is to gain power. Um, and so, you know, if, if you're, you're just truly just curious, what would happen if I did this? I mean, it's not clear that you're actually explicitly aiming towards power. Um, but I mean, so it, it seems like if you are getting power through serendipity, it's more implicit. Like it's something like just by virtue of truly falling into something, some, stumbling into something cool, it creates a little bit of power around you. It's like people might care about it. You might be empowered because you can do more because it's, it's I mean, what does it mean to be cool? It's like something, something that does something that's worth some attention. Um, so there's, there's some, there's some like sort of, um, yeah, maybe tangential power jet power that's acquired through serendipity but not always i mean i, I think some, some of it's just pure um just purely for your own consumption you know like if you find a show you like or something i don't know what level of power uh you know maybe you can tell your friends so you did get a little bit of you get a little empowered by it um but i remember thinking like um early on when i was uh you know, when I was researching NEAT, like the earliest thing that I did was the NEAT algorithm, like in grad school, that was my dissertation. Um, like I didn't have much experience, like understanding how people get like uh, known or some, something like that in research or, or famous for that matter. I didn't really understand any of this. And I kind of just assumed that no one would care. Like, I don't, I don't think I was really motivated by people caring because I, I was just like, the thing that's really good about this is that I'm allowed to do it more it was more of that like i can just do what i want because it's interesting and i thought that was really cool that i could just like explore stuff and i had no idea that like a single person would ever care about this at all but i thought well it's really i like the fact that no one seems to have done this before that was sort of my motivation um it did maybe create power in the future because other people did end up liking it which really shocked me um you know like i, I didn't actually expect that um but um, but I think like the motivations there were not very objective. I mean, it's just like I was just really just curious and just really grateful that I was allowed to pursue my curiosity. Like I remember when I did my proposal, that I felt very very successful that they approved it. But mainly just because it was like, oh, I'm allowed to look at this for two years or something. I can just think about stuff I want. Um, that's I think that's more serendipitous thinking. Um, then just like, how am I going to influence people and, and control things and stuff like that? Um, but this is an issue I haven't put huge yeah. amount into. So maybe, maybe you have other thoughts about well, I, that. Well, I think it's, it's fascinating for a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, I guess I'm only arguing that it's the same kind of stuff as power. So I'm not necessarily saying that... Um, you know, serendipitous exploring will turn you into a, you know, into a maniac who wants to take over the world. I think there's a difference with having the volition and the ambition to want to take over the world 
But the paradox is, as you just said, if, if the person were to be successful taking over the world, it would be via a serendipitous process. And in a way, there is, because you, you always make the argument that there's not a monotonic increase mm. if you line up the objectives. But, but in a way, there, mm. there kind of is, because the, the first stepping stone embarking on this serendipitous process is, as you just said, oh, my God, I've now just got dominion over my creative thoughts. I, I'm no longer in the, for, in the gravitational pull of these people. I can now explore things that I genuinely find interesting and I'm in a very happy place. So I, I, I now have mm -hmm. uh, power over my, you know, my even br deciding how to brush mm -hmm. your, your mm -hmm. teeth on the left side or the right side is a kind of a kind of power and, mm -hmm. and agency. Mm -hmm. And then and then for whatever yeah. reason, the thought yeah. might occur to you, oh, I want to take over the world or it's an externalized process. And when you see several pockets <laughs> of, you know, independent serendipity yeah. um, being e executed, those pockets become clouds and then the clouds become very powerful. Uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, there's I would probably more use the word autonomy than 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 power when I think about like what I what I would be excited about um, when I get the chance to explore on my own. Like I, I gained autonomy and rather than that person telling me that this is your project. Now I can just say my own project. And, uh, but I mean, it, autonomy is a form of power. Um, so but I mean, going away from just like uh, semantics, I think that um, the problem is that there, there's some kind of entangling here between uh, like algorithmic issues and um, human psychology. Because I mean, like power seeking, it's not just an issue of an algorithmic question, like is it an objective or not? It's also like a psychological issue, like with us. And, you know, algorithms might not have that psychological component to them. Uh, like if I try to create an open-ended algorithm or something, something really like a psychological explanation for why it's doing things. Um, but in terms of humans, we actually, yeah, we, we do seem to like getting dominion over th more and more stuff. So it's true that like a stepping stone might be interesting because it gave us more influence over the world. And then we can jump off from there to something else that would also be serendipitous, which actually as a side effect creates even more influence. And in some way we're following a gradient of power we're getting more and more influence. Um, and that's, that seems to be, um, just a, something that's psychological, like the fact that we like that or care for that. Or, um, and, um, but, but I guess like the point about agency makes sense that like, you know, you're, you're actually gaining agency. Um, well, if, if you can do serendipity, I'm not sure serendipity is causing you to have more agency or is it that agency is causing you to have serendipity? Um, cause the agency is sort of like necessary in order to explore, but then you could argue that because you were successful and you found something, you'll have more agency on the next iteration, um, of your exploration. I mean, so maybe they, they, they feed into each other in some way. Um, but that's just a side effect of the way that society rewards things. Um, I'm not, I'm sure that's like an algorithmic principle. Um, but yeah, th there's definitely some, some, uh, entangling between these two ideas. I can see that. What would your main argument be for the morality of people being able to independently shape their world? <laughs> well, I, I guess there is a moral component to it. I mean, if I didn't think so, I wouldn't have gone on with Joel to write a whole book. I mean, I, I thought that this is actually a, a wrong that should be corrected in the world. And it, it's, um, it's partly for practical or you could even say utilitarian purposes that I actually think that we will be more effective as a society um, by allowing more serendipitous exploration like that that actually is important for our survival and continuing progress so uh, but 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 I mean it's also true that for individuals and um, the uh, like the human flourishing like to be to actually be happy it seems like it does seem to be an intrinsic aspect of human nature that there's a need for self-expression. I mean, I do believe that too, um, which is a really interesting thing about, you know, human nature, because like when we think about things that are getting better at disseminating content to us that we would like, um, like that is, that sort of implies that human nature is mostly about consumption. Um, you know, it's like the whole thing is to optimize your consumption. Um, so that you're satisfied, you feel satisfied. And like, it's like the, the ultimate end point of that seems to me to be like that there'll be an AI that just basically 24 hours a day generates movies that are just optimized for your brain. Um, so you don't have to do anything. Just sit there and consume. It's like all perfect for you. You're like, that's the best show I ever saw. And then another best show you ever saw all day long. 
But the thing is that like that can't possibly work because of the fact that at least my theory is human nature requires self-expression. Um, you have to also um, produce in it in addition to consume to be a satisfied person. Um, and that relates to serendipitous exploration. Like you cannot produce without exploring. Um, and so like people deserve and need this like in order to have meaningful lives. Um, and that's harder to achieve. Um, but it's, I think it's a moral issue though. Um, because to me, yeah, that there's a, there's a real, uh, diminishing of the value of life if everything is consumption. Um, and that seems to be actually where these systems are heading, like in terms of social media systems, um, content ranking systems, like it's not just social media, like ranking of movies and ranking of books and everything about ranking, um, is all to optimize consumption so that you're, you know, most of your time is taken up consuming with the optimal thing, which is like the thing that most people want to consume. Um, and that does seem like there's like more and more going towards, like actually it, it can consume your day um so it can work i think like you can actually just sit around consuming things all day it's easier to do that than it was 200 years ago um but um but yeah you're, you're, you're sacrificing something like really important um which gives meaning to life and existence which is way harder to build for like is to to enable self-expression. That's another maybe angle on I think why I wanted to do the the Maven system because it's like um, not trying to optimize for consumption. I mean, it is true giving you diversity of things, but the hope is that those trigger you to do something like to do your own self-exploration. Um, like it's going to lead you to participating in that discussion or just to doing something else outside in your own life um, because you've been exposed to something different. Um, than what's like the optimal consumption object, which is just something that we could keep you around for hours, but it doesn't really do anything for you. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a huge moral component to it. Um, and it's like really, really, uh, sad to me, like that, like everything is consumption oriented. And when I, I just don't think, I think everyone is ultimately needs self-expression. We're just like running trajectories in our head and we're kind of thinking, you know, when I go to that place, I get the coffee, I get the dopamine. But then there's the question of, well, where does the volition come from? Because just from a neuroscience point of view, there, there is kind of goal optimization because your brain is just doing this clever search problem. We don't know how it solves the search problem. So it's somehow cutting down the exponential trajectories and it's doing mm -hmm. all of these like little paths. And, you know, we, we eat the cookie and we get the dopamine. And, and then the volition uh, arises from that prediction process. But then aren't you just, yeah. isn't that just a form of, of goal seeking in a way? And the, the serendipity and the stepping stone collection mm -hmm. is kind of instrumental to that. Well, it, to me, it highlights that any grand theory, which it sounds like um, this is one attempt at one, uh, needs to account for um, our intrinsic drive to explore for its own sake. Mm. Um, and if it doesn't account for it in a satisfying way, it wouldn't be a satisfying theory to me. So if it really is like it, it's, it turns out like it's like a mystery within the, the you know, framework of the theory. Why would anybody care about just exploring? Like, why wouldn't you just try to maximize dopamine immediately and go to the coffee shop or something like that? Well, then there's, I feel like the theory is missing something. It's not that theory is completely wrong, throw it out, it has no value. But this is the thing we need to figure out. Like, it's really... Um, it's, it, it comes up everywhere because it, it always seems to be the last afterthought um, of uh, like every theory, every algorithm, like an AI. It's like all of them are very good at dealing with goals and how we figure out how to get rewards and things like that. But it's this huge afterthought of like where is intrinsic motivation coming from? And, I, you know, obviously there, there are even intrinsic motivation algorithms. It's not that no one thinks about this. But even that often is thought of as an afterthought. It's like there's like the main branch of reinforcement learning and then there's this little weird sub section of intrinsic motivation people thinking about. But to me, it's like, that's not the sideshow, that's the real show. Um, you know, it's like, it's amazing to me, like how insanely creative people are. Um, that like, you know, because like, even like mundane conversations are actually creative. Um, and like, that's something that really like hits me when I talk to like Ch chat GPT or something like that. It's like, I, I wonder why I can't, I don't want to, it's not that I can't, but I don't feel very motivated to just like, you know, just talk about like random stuff with it. Just like, you know, shoot the breeze and just enjoy it. Like a conversation, like it's just like pointless. There's no, it doesn't, because it seems like even like just talking to just some random, 
like so let's say someone who's not impressive in any other way, whatever that might mean, like you can still have a conversation with them where it's unpredictable and interesting. But people are just really good at doing that on like a moment by moment basis. And just like that is not part of current AI at all, like at, at, at the granular level or at the macro level, just not there. Um, and then these theories don't account for it either. Like, the, and yet it seems to me, but this is all just, um, you know, speculative that this is not like some kind of formal theory, but it's just my intuitive, strong belief that um, this is central to what it means to be human and intelligent as a human is that like the, the fundamental drive is towards exploration. Um, you see it from childhood all the way out. And it's just like, I think it's, and if you want to know why, like, where does the drive come from? It probably relates to some extent to our success. Um, you know, like as a species, like we're, um, it's useful to be this way. Um, it doesn't have to be that useful because like, remember, evolution is not itself only about optimization. Um, but it has to be useful enough to keep us alive. Um, and so it's, 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 it's useful enough. It may be that like, it's, you know, it's rel related to highly efficient algorithms that can create things like us. Um, you know, for example, like early on in life, when you're learning things like how do you walk or something, or how do you, how do you talk? Um, I think it may be helpful that it's not an optimization process that we actually be less efficient. It was an optimization process. Like we optimize walkers. You know, this was a classic experiment in novelty search was that we took like a biped robot and tried to evolve it to be the optimal walker. And we also did a novelty search and the novelty search produces better walkers. Um, because it's just like the stepping stones, like starting from scratch are just like not what you would expect. So actually optimization, like the ones that lead to walking. So optimization turns out actually fairly relatively inefficient. And it's maybe better to just have this baby just like interested in trying stuff. Like what can I do with my arm? And I just like swing it around. What can I do with my leg? And maybe this is a good way to build up um, like a repertoire of skills, which is why repertoires keep coming up in like quality diversity and stuff like that. Um, it's just better for building up a repertoire than like you have to learn how to do this, you have to learn how to do this, you have to learn how to do this. It's like this all big set of objectives. Each one is a separate optimization process. Um, like that's just like really inefficient and awkward. Um, and so maybe it emerges from the fact that that's actually a good way of like, you know, encompassing a huge bundle of skills and, and abilities or a repertoire. Um, and then emerges from that, that that just like remains a driving force throughout life, although it's squelched because of social types of pressures, um, but it's still part of our nature, I think. Um, and so um, I don't actually want to claim to have a, a all encompassing theory here about this. Um, but I, I do think I can uh, criticize any theory that doesn't have it. Um, yeah, because like, it seems to be always missing and always just like, well, you know, I don't, why should I have to defend myself for how I'm going to fit it into Friston's theory? I mean, it's his problem. <laughs> like he, if he can't like just show that strongly it's predicted by his theory, you know, that, that we should have this huge drive. I think the theory needs to be, um, get some scrutiny. And again, I don't mean to criticize it like holistically. There's probably lots of good ideas in there, um, but something there really needs to be addressed. Yeah, I mean, there's also this spectrum of um, enactivism, which is to say on the extreme enactivism side of things, you could just argue that there is no volition, there is no planning, there is no kind of sophisticated exploration. And so you could just argue in some sense that, you know, I just happen to be here and what, what we think is creativity is pure serendipity. It's just my local physical and social embedding. The reality I'm sure is somewhere in the middle that it's a combination of serendipity, but also some sophisticated planning and volition. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I accept that planning happens. I believe so. Um, there's planning, volition, um, and it's a mix. Like you said, that that's my 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 guess about things. Um, so, um, yeah, we we should we should try to understand. I just don't get interested in it because I feel like it's the easy thing to explain. Um, you know, it's like you have all these grandiose theories about how we plan. Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree. It's something we should figure out. Um, and I, by easy, I don't mean it's actually truly easy. But it's the easier part of the problem. I mean, it reminds me of Chalmers' hard problem and stuff. I mean, I'm not talking about consciousness. That's a really, really hard problem. But, you know, Chalmers splits up consciousness into the easy part and the hard part. It's the hard problem of consciousness. Um, I think that's really conceptually useful, like, to think about, like, the easy part and the hard part um, so that we understand there's still something missing here. That, like, even with all these grand theories, like, this still over here is not being addressed. 
I think it's sort of similar in the world of intelligence, even or like human intelligence and AI, um, that like there's this like tendency to like spend all this time grinding away at the easy problem um, of like, you know, just like just cognition and planning and following objectives and optimization. It's like, how does all this happen? And prediction, prediction is another one of those like easy things, I think. The hard thing is creativity. Like that's much more complicated, actually, and difficult to explain because it requires computing things like interestingness which are far harder to formalize than something like, you know, how well am I walking right now compared to five minutes ago? Like you can, you can pretty much formalize that kind of thing. Um, so there's the easy problem and the hard problem. And I just find the easy problem like somewhat less interesting. Um, when we really want to get to the heart of uh, what is like going, going to be AGI, like it's going to have to somehow account for the creativity side of things. Yeah. And I would argue there can be no creativity without agency. So there, there, there seems to be a very close relationship between those two concepts. Is there an interesting point there, though, that on, on most social media now, 99% of people are consumers and they're perfectly OK with that? Mm. Maybe that's not the right way to, to frame it because every, everyone's a publisher in the mm -hmm. sense that they have their photos and they have their status and stuff like that. But, but most of their activity is, is consumption. Yes, um... That's true. Uh, that will be st still the case here. So, um, you know, I, I don't think we're going to ch fundamentally change the fact that the majority, the vast majority of users are just consumers and, and lurking. Um, and, and, and but remember that, like, you know, one thing people have been telling us is that, like, the emotional experience of like scrolling through this feed is very different. So for those people who just want to consume, um, you know, you're not going to have this feeling of uh, constant conflict and um, like constant emergencies like this feeling I remember when the pandemic started like, like Twitter was absolutely or, or even Quora it was just like sickening to scroll through I mean it's just like it caused mass panic in my mind um, like that kind of feeling of like everything is in your face as it possibly can be to grab your attention to freak you out as much as possible like that's not like that at all uh, people are just pursuing curiosity um, and so it's, a, it's, it's also, I think, a beneficial to, to those who don't care about um, actually producing content. But it's worth emphasizing that for those who want to actually be part of a conversation, it it's definitely presents an opportunity because you, you don't need followers. Like you come into the system and, you know, there are, there's, there's no concept of following in the usual sense. You can actually like another person's profile, um, which just means you'll remember their profile, but it won't affect your feed in any way. So it's not like you'll see more of their stuff if you do that. So it's not following, it's just a way of remembering people that you thought were interesting. Um, and so because of that, um, you know, like the 1% of people or the 0.1% of people who have like 10,000 followers or something like out in the other parts of social media, uh, they have a huge, huge advantage over you um, in terms of you've got something interesting to say today, but nobody's going to hear it. So you got to build up that following. But on Maven, you could just day one, like it doesn't matter. Everybody's equal in this sense. Like it's just going to be sent to people who share the interest that you have. So you have a shot uh, regardless of following um, that's equal to everybody else. And so for the 99% of people in that boat, it's worth a try, you know, because if you want to actually discuss, like 99% of people who want to post who are in that boat. If you want to discuss something, you have a chance here to actually find like-minded people who will actually respond to you. But even the people who are in that small elite, I still think they get a benefit because of that whole point we discussed about um, the fact that they're not, they're not obligated to continue to perpetuate their persona, that they feel they're obligated to, to perpetuate like in all the other social media, because that's why people are following them is because they are who they are. Um, and so like, yeah, if, if they want to inquire about some random concept that they don't really have authority in, um, they should feel totally comfortable because, you know, the thing about Maven is they can do it and the people who follow them for other reasons will probably won't see it. It doesn't matter. They're in a different community it's sent to people who do have those interests. Um, so I think everybody could get a potential, um, productive benefit, uh, from just, uh, the different, the different way that participation works in this case. Some people say that on Facebook you get echo chambers. So in a way you're your desire to be heard is met through this fractionation 
into many, many small interest groups. In a way, no matter who you are, your voice can be heard. But of course, heard in a weird echo chamber that nobody cares about. But you could say the same about Maven in a sense that your voice is heard, but only by John in Maryland. And, you know, like if I'm if I'm trying to get my voice heard by the right people to seek power or to get a job or something, you could argue that that doesn't help me much more than Facebook does. Yeah, no, I, I, I do agree that like if your point is to actually uh, to amplify your voice, like to make an announcement, this is probably the wrong service for that. Yeah, because it's, it's not like a, a medium for virality. So it doesn't offer that. Um, what you get here is the opportunity to pursue your curiosity. Um, and so like John in Maryland, it's probably not enough to start a social movement. Um, but if you're interested in whether it's even viable to start your social movement or like what are the pros and cons or the arguments about what you want to say, well, John and Marilyn might actually be an interesting foil to have a discussion with um, because John and Marilyn is interested in talking to you about this, which is a good thing because like how are you going to find someone who is interested in talking about this thing? Um, and so you can have a conversation there and it doesn't have to be this um, inflammatory style of conversation where John needs to beat you because he needs to get followers for his cause, um, even if he disagrees with you, because he can't get followers for his cause through this. It's just, a, it's just an intellectual exploration. And so for that purpose, this is really good. Like you can talk to people about things you're interested in. And if you want to go through amplification and like have a newsletter or something, you, you would do that somewhere else. Um, but we offer this opportunity to actually have a conversation. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So this is about this general theme of following your own <clears throat> gradient of interestingness. And you can talk to John in Maryland because he has the same gradient as you. Yeah, yeah. And you're certainly not an echo chamber in terms of agreement because, I mean, I mean, you, mo you both may be interested in AI ethics, but you both may have the opposite opinion. Um, so that's different than following a person, you know, because you follow the person because you agree with them. So that's why I like that person. So you tend to have a lot of people who agree with you. Um, and so this is not like that at all. Do you feel social media is broken? And are, are you seeing how it affects yeah. people around you? Yeah. I mean, you know, I was feeling there's something I was feeling in AI around the time that I decided to do this, uh, like a year and a half ago, um, when I started thinking about this seriously. Um, and I was just like getting this feeling probably from social media of just negativity lingering around AI, like increasing, which is like really new to me. Um, cause you know, I, I was in AI for decades and, and it was like a really, um, like just like a nice fun club of people pursuing their intellectual interests for a long time. Like there was no ethical consideration. I mean, it would come up like, uh, you know, like in, in very abstract terms, like, like decades ago, like whether, you know, there might be danger in AI or something. It's like, that's so far off. Like they really need to worry about this. Um, but like suddenly it just hit like a couple years ago, you know, like everybody, not just me, but it's just like suddenly hit that like, this is not like a political issue, a social issue. It's a polarizing issue. And I was starting to try to understand like, where do I fit into all those issues that, that are like complicated answers and arguments about them, like in terms of like the ethics and the safety and all these different things. Um, and then also this idea that like, just like our, our lives are going to be pervaded by like chatbots and stuff which hadn't really occurred to me like concretely um for a long time um and i yeah so it just kind of hit me all at once like all this stuff and i just started feeling like i would just like to do something that's just like definitively clearly nice like just really nice like i was starting to feel like i'm not sure what i'm doing is nice anymore it's not that i advocate that we all stop ai research i'm not one of those people i'm not saying stop ai research but it was just for me personally, as I'm sorting out all these issues, um, I was just like, what could be just like clearly, definitively socially positive, at least to try. Um, so I can just feel good. Like I'm just doing something without having to think about all this other complicated stuff. It just makes my mental burden easier. And that's something that emotionally contributed also to going in this direction. Because I just thought, you know, there's obviously, there's obviously a problem socially with social media. Um, it's having a lot of bad effects on us and there's not a lot of disagreement about that from like all sides. Like everybody seems to agree with that. It's got a lot of negative effects on discourse, on emotions, on how people feel about themselves. Like, and, and so I, I, I was like, you know, if AI could help with that, like that actually is like a win-win probably on all sides. So I could just do something I feel proud of basically for a while 
And then in the meantime, I can think about what I really think about all these issues that are very complicated because I wasn't really sure what I think about all of it. Um, it's hard to adjust when you just think of it as a game basically for 20 years. And it's just like a fun game that you're playing. And then suddenly like it has all these social implications you didn't really think about. Like it's just like I need time to absorb this and understand it. So I'm just going to do something. I feel like Maven would be a social positive. I'm not 100% sure it's going to succeed. Um, but I feel like it's pretty clear it's trying to do something nice. Because if I try to give up likes and follows, I, I'm going against the grain in a way that's extremely risky. It's not like I'm trying to exploit people and extract money from them. I'm like going the opposite direction. So how can I make that into a business? It's going to be complicated. Um, but I can feel good about myself. So that's kind of like another thing that led me in this uh, direction. The thing that was nice about it is that it, it's, it is dovetailing on my AI research, right? It's not like I just like, oh, let's just forget about AI and do social media. It's like all the insights from quality, diversity, from open-endedness, they all come to bear on this. So I didn't feel like I was just like giving up like all of the intellectual effort of the last 20 years. I felt like this just naturally builds on top of it. Like it doesn't have to be explicitly an autonomous AI system, just like PicBreeder itself wasn't, you know, like you can make a system that wraps open-endedness principles around people and still use a lot of the ideas like the minimal criteria and stuff that I've been thinking about. And so it wasn't like, just like, I'm just dropping out. It's just like an extension, but like in a direction that allows me to sidestep a lot of these sticky issues yeah. right now. You know, I interviewed yeah. your student and co-author Joel Lemon and, you know, he obviously he grew up on this idea of, of um, greatness cannot be planned. And now he's very yeah. concerned with um, AI risk. And you were saying about ethics and actually a lot of this, a lot of your concern with Facebook, with ethics, with risk and so on is because it's um, serendipity eroding. So I said to Joel, how do you kind of juxt uh, juxtapose this kind of thing that you wrote about with Kenneth, which is that we should be serendipitous. And now you're being quite paternalistic and consequentialist, which is the complete diametric opposite of serendipity. How do you ju just juxtapose those two ideas? And he said, mm. I don't know. Look, when it comes to those AI risk issues, safety issues, ethics issues, um, I just feel comfortable saying I don't know about a lot of it. Like, I don't know what I should conclude exactly about a lot of things. I do have opinions about it, of course, but I mean, that'd be a whole other show. Um, but like, yeah, I, I don't have firm conclusions to come to yet. Um, and um, I think we, we need some time um, to understand, uh, like, like, like open-endedness, um, it's still like, it's super fascinating from just like an autonomous AI perspective. It may be essential to achieving AI, uh, but what are the implications of it in terms of safety and things like that? Uh, it's like a very complicated issue. Um, so yeah, I mean, I agree with Joel. It, it's, a, it's a little bit tricky to, uh, um, to try to reconcile all these different things now with everything we've, we've been doing. Um, and uh, yeah, why not just drop some people into a nice open-ended system and do something else for a while um, while I'm trying to figure this out. Um, and um you know, I, I think there are things open ends can contribute. One, one thing I think is you can't get out of, you can't get out of the problems of AGI uh, without confronting open endedness. Like I think open endedness is part of this. Like it has to be confronted. Like the whole problem is that it is open ended. In my view, like that is actually the most fundamental aspect of the problem. Like if it wasn't open ended, it wouldn't be as much of a problem, but also wouldn't be very interesting. Um, and so I wouldn't be AGI in my view. Um, but then on the other hand, like the, the open endedness is helpful then for understanding what the risks are at, at some level, because like controlling an open ended system, which is like a paradoxical thing to try to do, is the problem of safety. Um, like how do you actually get an open ended system to not go over certain lines that are like really like un unacceptable, but still have it be open ended? Like that's a challenge. Well, that's what open endedness research is about. Um, so in some sense, open-endedness could be very important to continue to research because we need to understand this now from a safety point of view. Um, but anyway, for now, uh, I'm yeah going to be uh, just uh, building this network. Uh, and uh, But uh, yeah, on, on the side, I think about these things a lot. Yeah, and I agree. I don't know. I mean, I'm a little bit skeptical about AI safety, but just as a thought experiment, AI could be the technology that if, if you democratize it, it could just have catastrophic, you know, um, unforeseen consequences. And then, as you were just alluding to, if you place constraints in the system, then you have all of the problems that you've spent your career talking about. So it's, it seems like uh, it's, almost, it's almost like um, Pandora's box 
that this is the one technology that kind of breaks everything and now we need to have a paternalistic society. Yeah, yeah, except, I mean, the, the thing that I think about is just that, you know, humans are also very dangerous and open-ended. Yeah. We are open-ended and, and, and we're, we're, we have AGI sort of, like we are general <laughs> um, and, and we're really dangerous and we can like kill each other and kill many of each other and so forth and we can destroy society if we want, if we, if we put our minds to it, we could do it. Um, and um, but so we've been confronting this issue. It's not like a new issue, actually. Um, the issue of how to control an open-ended system is the issue of society itself, or I would say the issue of civilization. Because civilization also confronts the problem that like it needs to be open ended enough to continue to progress. Like if you put the brakes on too much, then progress stops, and like you have extremely authoritarian systems. Then, um, like if people can have any freedom at all, um, but you know, then there's the problem: is it too much freedom? Too much freedom? Is too much open endedness? Is also extremely dangerous. Like there have to be brakes on something. Um, but it's interesting that this is this is a problem we have been dealing with. Like that's how I think about it. So it's it's not like a new problem actually. It's new what it's applying to, but the problem itself has existed. And so I think that like, you know, all the institutions of government and society and culture have grown up around trying to control an open ended system from going out of control, but still be open ended. We actually have a lot to draw on there, like how we've done this in the past. Um, but it's different than let's make a benevolent dictator that like loves us all. Like that actually is not what society has done. And when it tried to do that, it didn't work very well. Um, and so like this is much more complex at like a, a cultural and sociological level, you know, controlling open ended systems. But it's I think it's interesting that we've seen it um, and it involves people. You can think of um, it as being an agency problem. So we're, we're a society that uh, values individual agency and the technologies that have a large blast radius at the moment are controllable in the sense that it needs significant resources to get access to them. But if you did believe that AI posed an existential risk and it's democratized, then given a high agency society, it would presumably be impossible to control it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's true. AI is a, a very special uh, case that isn't like things that have come before. I mean, I agree with that. Um, and but you can something like institutions are relevant like because institutions prevent certain things from happening. I mean, like a, a bunch of people could get together and build a nuclear bomb if there weren't institutions. Um, like, like if you say anybody could just do whatever they want, they can go mine uranium and do whatever they want. Um, like, like there are restrictions on what can go where and how it can go because there are institutional restrictions. And I think AI needs to be embedded in some kind of institutional framework, but it's probably some of the institutional framework are AIs, um, which would bound what AIs can do. And so it's probably a multi-agent thing. Um, but in the end, that's just like, you know, really speculative. Like, what am I even talking about? Like in reality right now, what you're saying, I think is true. Like we're looking at um, unprecedented possibilities that, that can't be fully understood. And therefore it makes sense to, to move cautiously um, and think about it. Um, but, but I think also it's, you can't just not move also, you have to move. Um, and so um, it's just a needle threading exercise for, for society. I kind of think of a lot of this goal directedness stuff that you're talking about as being a story of agency and how there's a very complex natural way of things in the world and we all have spheres of agency and there are physical agents and social agents and you could think of um, agency or autonomy as just being a kind of force of yourself around the world around you a bit like a gravitational force of the sun you know things orbit around the sun and having autonomy is about having things orbit around you rather than you orbiting around other things. So it's about the, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's almost, you can kind of imagine a solar system of, of, of orbits and, and where the, the kind of the generating sources of agency are coming from. Yes, and then, of yeah. course, it gets much more complicated when, mm -hmm. when you think about that in the world of intelligence, because then agency isn't just about this very simple gravitational force. It's about active sense making and planning and being able to kind of, you know, uh, develop sophisticated behaviors to change the world around you well that's that's interesting um so yeah i mean the agency point is interesting i can see the connection between agency and objectives um it, it sort of like uh objectives reflect the set of rules that already confine you and so you're operating within those set of rules um but you could create your own rules and that would be to, to actually 
uh, express some agency in the world. So if if goals are an instrumental fiction, and I guess what I mean by that, if, if planning and goals are an instrumental fiction, there are a way of post hoc rationalizing complex behavior. So we, we kind of project this cognitive map, if you like, to understand physical phenomena. And it's not to say it doesn't exist in the real world. Of course it does. But it's, um, it's very diffused. And the, the, what we think of as planning is actually a very complex, low-level information sharing yeah. between all the particles in the system and, and so on. But, yeah, but then, yeah, but then yeah. the question is, well, obviously, if we, if we simulated the system at a sufficiently high resolution, um, obviously, we would capture those dynamics. But I think what you're saying is, well, why don't we come up with an abstract model and still capture as many of the dynamics as possible? And mm -hmm. I guess that's, that's the gap that I'm trying to understand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe it, it's like instead of because that's this pretty high level abstract to, to think about like how, you know, at what how many dynamics can be captured through some abstract algorithm. I mean, I, I think maybe it's better to think like what, what exactly more concretely am I saying? I mean, like algorithmically capture something um, like what exactly am I talking about? Like basically what I'm talking about is the fact that for individuals, um, in order to have serendipity, you need to be exposed to the right stepping stones. Um, like this is what leads to serendipity. And like the assumption that I have is that the right stepping stones for you are not the same as the right stepping stones for me. Um, it's very idiosyncratic, like what is actually going to be transformative for you, which also makes it hard to predict for you what's transformative for you. So nobody really can say for sure, um, but it has something to do with exposure. Um, like you need to be exposed to things that would be transformative or else they just won't lead to the transformation. You're the one who can make the transformation if you were exposed because someone else won't do it. But if you're not exposed, you won't do it. Um, so it's important for people to be exposed to right things. I mean, it goes all the way back to Pick Breeder that we saw things like, you know, the, the, the woman there who really loved the bugs. Um, and so being exposed to bugs or bug precursors was a, like a triggering event for her, although she didn't know it. Um, and then she was like really uh, crazy inside a bug space. Um, and so that was important for her to get exposed. And, and like the pick breeder system was good at like large scale exposure of stepping stones, partly because it's images. So it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a cheat because like it's really easy to scan huge numbers of images very quickly. It's not so much true of like just content in general or especially written content. Um, but so people were, were getting a diversity of exposure, which meant that they can go in many directions, which is like in aggregate, very divergent as a system. Um, and so this, this is, it was interesting is that it conflicts with social media, which is actually consensus driven and convergent because of that, which is basically like, it's basically based on a model that says like, if more people agree that something would be interesting to you, then will you have a higher probability of being exposed to that thing, um, which is like antithetical to your idiosyncrasies. But it's still going to be true that like, if most people like it, then there is a high chance that you'll like it because you are one of most people usually. Um, but it, what it doesn't do is expose you to the things that are idiosyncratic to you because consensus can't do that. Um, so you're missing all those things. Um, and so in, then what we should be doing in a system that's geared towards serendipity is not allowing consensus to decide what you're exposed to. Um, and so that's clearly radical. I think that's quite radical because like all of social media rests on this assumption. It's almost like a natural law in social media. Like people don't even question that like that is like it's like the way in the notes you use the word social. It's like you call them social features, like as if that like there's a synony they're synonymous with being social. It's like you have to have these things. These are consensus mechanisms. Um, yeah. But I think like what I'm saying in like these kinds of I want to say algorithms, like the insights from the algorithms, not see the algorithms themselves, because I'm not saying like run novelty search on top of a person. Um, but the, the insights from the algorithms, they suggest that that won't work for a serendipitous exposure. Um, and so what we can do is basically try to expose you to things that match your interests. And then from there, you'll be able to see lots more of that like opportunity surface, you could say, of what might actually be triggering to you. And the assumption is like, look, there's like a lot of stuff bubbling around under the surface of all of this consensus, um, which is very like sp spiky in terms of convergence, you know, because like if you think about it, like a lot of a lot of the conversation of the day 
even if it doesn't involve somebody with a big megaphone, like it goes back to the person with the big megaphone. You just don't realize it. Um, you know, if Jan LeCun says something about AI today because he has, I don't know, 300,000 followers or something on, on X, then like a lot of people are going to be talking about that thing uh, unwittingly or not. Um, and so there's a lot of convergence yeah. day by day on like, what are the topics? And yet there are lots of people who have something interesting to say in AI. And I, I wouldn't say that like Jan LeCun isn't interesting because he's obviously earned his place and his megaphone. But the thing is, he's redundant because he says similar things constantly and he, they keep on dominating. And of course, it's not just him. There's like maybe 100 people that like are like this. Um, but those people basically are dominating and can set in conversation with it. And then there's the 100,000 people who aren't those people. Because after all, like, you know, I, I think I read the statistics that like on X, like it's about 0.1% of the population that has 10,000 followers or more. So 99.9% .9 of them are at a level where you're likely never to hear anything they have to say unless they're replying to Jan LeCun. Um, and so those yeah. people have lots of interesting things to say, but not interesting in a consensus sense, but interesting to you um, in a sort of idiosyncratic sense, some more than others, but they have idiosyncratic things to say. Um, some are, would probably be consensus interesting, but like they just have trouble getting consensus because they don't have enough followers yet. Um, but the thing is that like all of that churning stuff um, you're not getting exposed to uh, generally in a, in a consistent level. Um, and so it would make sense to intentionally design something to work like an open-ended system because an open-ended system would have these mechanisms that actually that kind of exposure would be routine rather than like require enormous effort and a megaphone and very rare. Um, and so that would be, that is possible actually to create a system like that. We understand how systems like that work. They're actually not that hard to understand. The problem with the reason that they can be built, the reason they're hard to build like artificially is because they're missing human intelligence. Um, I mean, because human intelligence is part of what makes these kinds of systems run. And that hasn't quite been conquered yet. But the thing is, like, if humans are in the loop, the outer structure of such a system is understood. Like, we do understand this. Now we have humans in the loop. If the social network. Um, so we just have to fold this thing around them that has this kind of exposure and we can um, fix that. But I just want to point out that like the side effect of that, it's not just about increasing serendipity. It's that it, the incentive change being so dramatic changes like a number of things that really change dramatically. You know, like where's the incentive for clickbait? It's not there anymore because there is no such thing as virality. Um, and like you, why would you promote yourself in a situation like that? Like if you actually want to cause a scene, say something offensive, Maybe that gets you attention here. What's the point of getting you won't get more attention because it won't be amplified. Um, and so like in a large sense, like human behavior is vastly changed. The incentive system has vastly changed on top of it. And so this should be it should be actually a good form of like detox from like all of the bad things that you see that are happening as unintended consequences. You said something interesting about Jan Lacuna. I noticed this as a podcast interviewer myself. People only really talk about three things at a time, three themes. People are incapable of thinking about too many things because of this convergence. I feel sorry for Jan Lacoon because he, he, he always practices saying the same things over and over again. So obviously for me as a podcaster, there's a trade-off between um, clout and actual real sources of entropy. And I'm trying not to influence the, um, the interviewee with my own views and sources of entropy because, mm. again, that creates these convergent um, measures. But anyway, on, on to the most important thing. You, you were just saying that um, some people argue that certain things are just the way they are. So there's this book called uh, The Status Game by Will Storr. And he says that we all, um, you know, we play the success game, we play the virtue game, we play the dominance mm -hmm. game. And you could argue that this is the real reason why social networks have virality, because people are playing the social games. And if you create an asocial network, then there's no game to be played. So maybe people won't be interested anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so, so... Uh, first, I mean, I that the fact that the word social get it gets like uh, you know kind, kind of um, entangled with this issue of like popularity is just like crazy to me. Like I can't the the word should be separated in my view. Um, you might argue that the network would fail because everybody is 
two motivated by popularity driven mechanisms so there's no way we're going to have a network like commercially successful network or, or even successful enough to have a community but that that's different to me than saying it's not social like that's a strange point to me like like socializing didn't used to have to do with these things like these are all rid ridiculous new ways of describing what it means to be social i mean there was no like button in my life before like 20 years ago i mean it, i did plenty of socializing it was not a problem not only that but i mean maybe more relevant to that because that that's that's more of just an emotional reaction like it's basically um it's there is precedent for having networks that are successful without these mechanisms um, and, you know, bulletin board services are really interesting, great precedent, you know, because obviously I spent, of course, a lot of time thinking about this. I understood that, like, this is a very radical proposition, including risky proposition. Like, will people be able to stick around in a place that's lacking things that they instinctually expect at this point, um, which are not only like instinctual, but like actually literally addictive. Um, and so it's like, you know, it really is like a detox. So you take people out of that, like, can that even work? And of course, I was thinking about that. I mean, I think one thing that creates an opportunity for that is like it, the counterpoint to the fact that it is so pervasive and people are so disgruntled gives a little bit of a boost to the opportunity to have an alternative. Like it may not have been in an earlier, like 10 years ago. Um, as potentially obviously appealing, like why this? Like it's not as fun as that. But but now people know that like this actually makes me feel ill. Like when I do this all day, maybe not everybody, but enough people um, that there's an opportunity there. But going back to precedent, like precedent is interesting here because like w whether or not people would just do it as some reactionary thing. Um, like these bulletin board services, I started studying because because I was trying to understand is there any example of successful social networking, like without these popularity mechanisms. Um, and I was, you know, surprised, like looking at PHPBB, which is like 1990s technology, you know, it's just a really boring thing that nobody in the industry talks about. I mean, I, like, I'm, I'm not an expert, actually, I should be on the industry, not my industry. But, you know, I, I listen to some, um, you know, some of the pundits and the pundits and the critics and things in the industry. And you like never hear them talk about, oh, wow, PHPBB, a really interesting, you know, cutting edge thing. But it is actually cutting edge. Like they still exist and at huge scale. Um, you know, like the, probably the biggest, I think, is City Data, um, which has like on its form two million people. Um, none of these mechanisms, like completely absent from it. Um, and I was trying to understand, you know, why, why is that? And there's lots of those, by the way, it's not just city data, they may be the biggest, but there's lots of just local websites with very thriving communities of people who have none of these mechanisms. They just use primitive bulletin boards, a lot of time, PHP, BB. Um, and why is that? Um, well, it's like, obviously they're like different. One reason is because like everybody there is interested in the same thing. Um, so they, they have shared interests. Um, and they know that people are interested in what they have to say. And they also are motivated because you don't have to be famous in order to actually be part of the conversation. Um, like nobody has a particular megaphone over anybody else. Um, and I was, you know, I'm shocked when I look at PHPBB uh, individual contributors, like you can see for people, you can see how many times they are, their posts have been read in aggregate. And there are tens of millions, tens of millions of reads on complete nobodies like, like, you know, Mr. Poodle 24, you know, he's got like 20 million views. Um, like he would be a celebrity in Twitter with that kind of thing. But this is in like this world where it just doesn't even get noticed. Um, and so people are getting, they are getting attention, um, but it's through completely different mechanisms and they feel part of that community. Um, and so like some of that guided some of the design choices that I, that I went to because I, I was trying to understand, you know, they've, they're very different kind of way of presenting conversations and things like, like it's very s more simplistic than most of these networks. Like networks use these kind of hierarchical structures to like have conversations break down into trees and things like that. Like PHPBB is like totally linear. It's more like a dinner conversation. It's just the topic is set by the first poster and then post, 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 post. Everything's just in order. The only thing you see is the latest like there's no attempt to rank anything at all. Um, it's just time. That's all. Um, it's ridiculously simplistic. And that I wasn't necessarily taking the lesson that we're just going to recreate PHPBB because I want to apply some of what I understand about open-endedness. But I thought in some ways it's like taking PHPBB into the future. This is like the futuristic version of PHPBB. You don't need to go to one website. You just automatically get sent to the people who find what you say interesting. Um, and we will actually have 
one thing that that I, we that is maybe not clear that comes up in or sort of implicit in some of what you're saying is we will have some quality mechanisms. I'm not totally against. Like you made an interesting point, which I thought was really insightful. And the notes about why would you in pick breeder have things like star ratings? Um, you know, you, you did do things like that. Like you let people have individual autonomy in their individual paths, but you still gave some ability to express quality directly and explicitly. Like, why wouldn't that also be true here? I think that's thought provoking to think about that. Um, and, but you know, we, what may not be obvious, I mean, even like having visited Maven is that there actually is a quality mechanism in there. Um, but what I took was the minimal criterion idea, which is like obscure probably. Um, like I wrote a bunch of papers with minimal criteria, maybe, well, not a bunch, maybe like five. They had minimal criteria. Like there was no novelty search with minimal, cri minimal criterion novelty search. There was minimal criterion co-evolution. Poet had a minimal criterion inside of it. It's this like obscure idea, which I've like always, I've loved for the whole time that I've uh, thought about it, which nobody else, well, if, maybe a few, but it never caught on like the way something like novelty search did. Um, it's, it's more obscure, but I, but I've always really loved it. And, um, because it's it's a way of interpreting evolution um, that I really liked, um, where it's like you don't necessarily think about it as on a continuum of quality, where it's like fitness is often presented that way, but rather you think of it either you succeeded or you didn't. Like if you get over the threshold, it doesn't matter. There's no need to rank. And the thing about this is this is about interpretation. It's not like a right or wrong type of thing because it's not really saying any specific explicit thing you should do. But it's just like interpretations of evolution. I really like this minimal criterion view because it suggests, it puts an emphasis on a different aspect when you think about evolution um, rather than the aspect of competition, which like I said, like I think leads to convergence. So I'm trying to understand what leads to divergence. Well, the minimal criterion is very effective at having some kind of quality standard. Like there's a minimal quality standard. You can't go below, so you can't degenerate. But other than that, you have total divergence. Um, and I think that's really appropriate for very subjective domains where it's very hard to say this is better than that. Um, and it really is that way with text and, and speaking, you know, because if you think about like um, stuff that's said on Twitter that's very subjective, like pearls of wisdom or something, um, like those really don't belong in a ranking. It's quite odd actually to have a, like a, on a strict continuum, like it, and this, I was thought of this because like someone on Maven said like a, a like a few weeks ago, like it list, could you just everybody reply with some really succinct pearl of wisdom that's meant a lot to you throughout your life. So you get this big list of like little pearls of wisdom from everybody. And I read through all of them and I just absorbed them in my own way because like they mean specific things to me. Some of them resonate more than others. And I was just thinking like, what would I have done if one was ranked at the top? Because it would be the rich get richer. So there'd be this extremely like top level piece of wisdom. So I wouldn't be thinking about anything. I would just be like, I don't want to waste my time on the crap ones. This is the good one. And then I can just leave. And there would be no thinking involved and I wouldn't get to absorb each one for its own right. Like how it interacts with me in my idiosyncratic way. And so, of course, there is total crap in the world, and we don't want that. Um, you know, like, I wouldn't want, like, the reply that said, like, everybody should just eat bananas or something. Um, but but there is something above that threshold. It starts to be much less clear, like, how we should rank things. So I've always been interested in this minimal criterion. But what you said, and, and we have that. So basically, we have a minimal criterion standard. So you're going to see this kind of evolutionary divergence where, like, the stuff below that you won't see circulate as much. So there is a quality standard, but it's not a maximization algorithm. That's what's so interesting about it. It's just a minimal algorithm. Um, so above that, you just get churn, like total churn, round robin the way you put it. Um, but your point made me think, because I was thinking, why didn't I just go to... Uh, you know, the, the, the pick breeder view of the world. Like I, we could have done that too in this kind of context um, and tried to in intermingle like ratings in some level. But I think, like I thought about this a lot just since I read your, your notes. And I think I concluded that um, it's not that it's like, there's a strict principle that would like s that suggest you shouldn't do that. It's more that like, I think the medium is, it's the interaction of the medium with the quality standard is very subtle. Um, so I obviously made a decision, but it was intuitive and implicit. Like I hadn't really thought about it a lot until you pointed this out to me. But I think that um, after thinking about it, like there's there's a mismatch between the pick breeder way of showing things and like uh, this kind of text-based social media content. Because I think the pick breeder stuff worked because I could really quickly show you all kinds of perspectives simultaneously. Like there was only one section of the pick breeder site that showed top ranked, like all time top ranked. 
was and, and like but but then there was a newest top ranked like new top ranked or the like highest quality new stuff there was random there was most branched and so there's like a whole set of different categories plus you could like go into individual like you could go to like faces or something um like individual categories and i yeah. and i think that that works there because they're pictures you can see all of it at once but i can't present all of content that way to you and i think that if i gave you top ranked um, as an option, like if I gave you a bunch of different panels, you would spend your whole life there, like in the consensus driven world, and it wouldn't be pip reader at all. Like we need to get divergence, we need to expose you to diversity. And so like, if I have this very narrow window, like the screen of a phone, and I also it's much harder for people to consume the content, because it's not pictured, you have to read it. I think the minimal criterion works a lot better. Um, because it doesn't require you to prevent present all these different views simultaneously, and have people like, like, equitably look at all of these different options like it's just like totally intuitive it's just like every other social media from their perspective but under the hood we're taking care of things to make sure that this is divergent and has like a bottom where you can't go below it um and so yeah. i think that's why we get to that point yeah because when i when i started using it and we'll introduce it properly um you know uh, for folks to understand but um i was met with a little bit of mild confusion because i didn't understand what was going on so we all have a mental kind of reference frame yeah. to understand the world and we were talking about yeah. goals and planning are quite a common one so um the thing about pick breeder is um i mean the clues in the name with the neat algorithm there is a topology there and in my mind and in the user experience you can actually see the topology you can understand the structure and on maven my my read of it was that it was quite flat so there's this minimal criterion mm -hmm. but we don't know what that is and then so it's a bit like the bias variance trade-off there's some structure and then like you you allow for complete variation um, above the minimal criterion and then all of those posts are kind of round robin um, allocated to to folks who use the system and then um, I guess I'm naturally looking for the next level of structure now based on your answer I, I agree with you you convinced me that the, the kind of the will store status game thing, um, it might be a component of the reason why Facebook is viral. But I agree with you. Look at my Discord server. Look at, you know, these PHP websites. People love recognition. They, they're interested in things. They love this serendipitous process. So, yeah, absolutely. That, that completely works. But I think what Facebook did, though, is, is they chose a proxy for interestingness, which perhaps is quite deeply ingrained with us because it's this social status thing that we all care about very much. And what mm -hmm. you're desperately trying to do, I assume, in Maven is to not choose any one topology, but to allow the topologies to emerge merge naturally but i guess my point is is that without the user experience kind of guiding what the topology is then it's almost like you don't get this reflexive feedback loop that you need for the system to work yeah there's such a complicated thing i mean there's a lot of points to that so like facebook in its genius um is you know that i don't know if it's genius as much as obvious like i feel like this were the first things i would try too. like like it's like i would put a like button it's just such an obvious thing to think of um i think what, what wasn't necessarily obvious was how addictive that is like that is such uh such a like a worm into so human psychology like it wouldn't be obvious at the at first i mean i notice it like getting likes on a post in, in x or something it's, it's like very distracting and consuming like is when your post is getting a lot of likes and that is weird because it's just a number going up. Like there's, there's nothing actually happening. Um, like it's not like I'm learning anything or something, but I can't look away from it anyway. Um, and so you could say that's genius because it hit on something really, really powerful. Um, and I don't think we can create anything as powerful as that. Like that is, it's just like, you know, it, it's, it's like, um, you know, um, you know, green beans can't compete with heroin or something. Like it's, it's like heroin is going to win like on, on the addiction scale. Um, but like, so we're going to, that is an uphill climb, I think at some level, um, that we have to deal with. Um, but there is, but in terms of structure, there is still structure. Like it's, it's, it's still not as powerful as that in terms of an addiction mechanism. Um, but we certainly have structure. I mean, it's, it's not just like you kind of sort of presented it as kind of like a flat like thing where it's like, it's like you totally have to just, um, derive your own structure from reality. You can't get any from the system itself. But you have to, the thing is, what we tried to do, there's two things. We tried, the first thing is we tried to replace, you know, the, the kind of addiction mechanism, which is this, like, um, this kind of uh, 
self-affirmation that you get like when you get these kinds of signals like a like signal or a follow signal with something else to do because you need something to do to occupy your time um, something that feels like an activity and that was to follow interests um, so that's why we said you do follow interests and not influencers that was like our first slogan it's current slogan maybe we'll change the slogan um, but so like yeah we see that so like by following interests of course like your world will not look like my world um, they're all customized around interests. Um, and, you know, the system is using AI to generate interests. So those interests, it's not like you just decide what your interests, you can if you want, you just type them in. Um, but you're seeing them surface constantly. And we've definitely seen people have been using that the way that it's intended, which is to constantly expand that like surface of serendipity um, because they see something pop up. You know, it, it, it's like you see something like, like, like AI for... Um, uh, for architecture, and it's like, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. So it's like, okay, I'll click that one, and then I'll follow that. And now that becomes something that they're interested in, and they didn't know. And you definitely see people growing their interest graph. Um, and so that's that's a new activity that we've introduced. I don't think it's as compelling as getting likes or follows, but it's something that's it's a it's a recreational activity. And the other thing is though that you 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 mentioned like the reinforcement signal, like that that's something that obviously. It's really, it's like directly is the likes and follows too, but it's, it's important um, for, for keeping people um, engaged. And there is a subtle thing going on like that. Um, I mean, in addition to the minimal criterion, which is a weak reinforcement signal, but there's the, um, the fact that replies get resurfaced in our system. Like our system is very respectful of replies, like in a way that like um, X isn't, for example. Like X, sometimes you see replies in your main feed but it's not systematic. Like generally, that's not that common. Um, I'm not sure what the algorithm is to decide, but you don't see them that much. But in ours, every single reply goes back to the top. And this is like respecting PHPBB style, you know, because they're like the, the top thread you'll see when you go there is always the one with the most recent reply. Um, and so we kind of show like the last few replies always, like whenever we like pop something back up to the top of the feed. Um, and this is basically causing that thing to get more exposure. It's just implicit. Um, and so like the most engaged posts, you see more and you're going to see like what's most recent on them. So there is a mechanism and it's even arguably objective, which is you could say it's bad in the big picture. But like you point out, like the real truth is it's not that you don't want any objective mechanisms that you want to balance. Um, like, like we can have people say something is high quality and pick breeder and still get an overall divergent process, but you can't have it dominate. That's a big problem. So I'm just trying to reduce the domination of the objective component because I've always thought like when it comes to quality and diversity, the real problem is that quality kills diversity when you make it like the primary thing. Like all the quality diversity algorithms are about trying to put quality in a box so it won't destroy diversity because if you're not careful, that's what will happen. Um, and so we still have yeah. some we still have some structure because of that. It's just like through the um, yeah th through the actual exchange uh, between person and person, um, and you would start to notice that hopefully implicitly like as a user that like the big conversations keep coming back over and over again, and that's what PHPBB users experience. So it, that's been shown to be uh, enough to keep people around. From an engineering perspective, do you have a cold start problem and do you have any thoughts on how the dynamics of the system will change at different levels of scale? Yeah, there's definitely a cold start problem, obviously, of course. Um, we, we face a stark, horrendous version of the cold start problem because, I mean, you have uh, just the general cold start problem for any company. Then you have the cold start problem for a social network, which I think is like generally really bad. Um, and then you have a cold start problem for a social network in the world today, which is worse than it used to be, um, because there already are all these social, established social networks. You, you know, when, when X started or Twitter started, uh, it, it was a lot easier. And in fact, um, one of our investors, our leader investor is Ev Williams, um, who is one of the founders of X or of Twitter when he founded it. Um, so we've had a lot of conversations about like, how, how did he start Twitter and stuff like that? And the story there is just, uh, um, of course, it's just impossible to reproduce today. You couldn't do it that way. Um, it was a different world where things like this could catch on um, organically, just independently. But now you're fighting against the fact that people already have homes or more compelling places to go because we're saying, come here and talk to a few dozen people or they could go over there and talk to a million people. Like, what, what would you rather do? That's a horrible cold start problem. Then it's even more exacerbated by the fact that we don't use addiction mechanisms. So we're not exploiting human psychology in the, in the usual way that can get you like, you know, off the ground with something like this. 
Um, so we obviously have a, an enormous cold start problem. Um, and so, but the thing about cold start problems is, I know much has been written and said about cold start problems, um, but I think like one important insight about cold start problems, and, and by the way, I'm not an authority because I haven't succeeded yet. So don't take my word for this, like I could be wrong. But what I think is that, um, you know, every cold start problem has to be solved in a way that is different from the past. Um, like there's not like a formula for how to win in the cold start race. So there's all this conventional wisdom, but it's from the past. It's like, this is how it was won before. The next thing that cold starts successfully, it'll be totally counterintuitive. It will be something nobody thought of as a way of handling the cold start problem. And so this is a unique situation that has never been confronted before. Like how can Maven actually solve the cold start problem? And it will be solved in a way that doesn't reflect conventional wisdom. Um, and so I think, you know, what gives us the opportunity. So there, we're obviously working on this from many angles because that is our problem. It's the cold start problem. Um, like we have, but we have some opportunity, some inroads into the cold start problem. Uh, one of them is just like we do have the, the goodwill of people because of the fact many people resonate immediately with the idea of getting some way out of all of the mess. Um, like it's now in the air and, you know, some of our investors like say and like they keep pounding on us too. They're like, look, this is the time to act like, like, look, everybody's upset. Like some new article comes out, but it's in the air that like everybody's disgruntled with social media for numerous reasons. And it's not, it's like pub, it's at a general public level, like pundits are saying it, but also individual level, like individual people, people say, you know, I just feel, I feel slimy and yucky and anxious and tired after I go through my feed or there's like terms like doom scrolling. And it's like, that creates a huge opportunity. You know, it, it's like an opportunity to actually go through a feed and not feel that way. Um, that's something people have been telling you. So I think if enough people can latch onto that, that's something. Something else that I think is going to help, which is I wanted to preview a little, is that we, we are adding other features too. Like obviously you're just seeing like version one here. We're going to add some other cool features, I think. Like there's some of them are like just gestating right now, but um, they're going to be some more pick breeder-ish things you can do in the service. These are, you know, some people say, you know, there has to be a single player mode. Like that's one way out of the cold start problem. That's one thing you hear sometimes, like something fun to do if there aren't other people around, which makes sense because if you're starting cold, there's no other people. Okay, we're taking that to heart. There'll be, there could be some fun things to do like that. Um, so we're going to, you know, approach this not just at the high minded level, but also at the practical level too. But hopefully coming at from these, all these different angles. Um, and exploiting the fact that like we actually are saying something virtuous, which is very unusual. You know, we're taking away all of these nasty things that exploit human nature and just letting people just be themselves. Like you can just pursue something for curiosity's sake. You don't have an incentive to get attention anymore because you can't get any followers. Um, and so like, what would be the point? So you also don't have a reason to be embarrassed because like you're, you don't have followers. So they don't care. Um, if you want to go ask something about something you don't know about, because I feel I have enough followers on X that I feel like I don't want to say certain things because I know what they expect. And I'm going to sound like an idiot, you know, because I actually only know about the things I know about. But there are some things I'd like to talk about, but like I don't really know well about them. Very uncertain. But I just basically don't feel comfortable doing that because I have all these followers. Well, you don't have that problem here. Um, and so you can do all these things. And I think that that can be powerful because, you know, people would will like to have some relief. Um, from this kind of pervasive nastiness, which like just like surrounds everything. I just like wonder what it's doing to us that every single thing you do is launched into the most cynical Darwinian competition you could possibly imagine. It's like, it's not even like the big things, it's like every single statement, like just one little reply for like one sentence, it's immediately launched into a Darwinian competition for the top comment. And it's just crazy. Like, what is that doing to our psychology? You can go here, you can relax, you yeah. can just be yourself, pursue your curiosity. I think we have a chance because of that. The reason why I asked you the question about the scaling, though, is, is it was a bit of a trick question. Um, Facebook, they went through this kind of, I mean, you can think of it as a revolution that Facebook and Google um, invented this relevance ranking, which is this idea that uh, we've got a whole bunch of data in our system and, and we do some collaborative filtering and machine learning and we do some objective optimization and, and we create these convergence things. And, and in a way, that's very good because, you know, there's lots of complicated information and it's a way of discarding what's not relevant and giving you what, what is relevant. But mm -hmm. on your system, it's almost like going back in time to the 1990s where you just, you just have a PHP bullet and board and you just do round robin and you just give people what they want and so my observation was that it works brilliantly now at the very beginning you 
almost don't have a cold mm. start problem. Mm. It, it works great. But but mm. but the question is more like, well, what will happen when you have a million users? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I missed that part of the question. That that is a really interesting part of the question. Um, you know, probably my mind doesn't go there first because I'm 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 like that's like the best problem to have. So that that's like what I think about less. I think, you know, I really got to worry about the problem of are we going to have a even like you know a, a, like ten thousand users. Um, but like, yeah, that's really interesting to think about. So what happens at scale? And, and many people have commented this, like the very earliest users on Maven, you know, loved the nice community, everybody they could trust. Like, it's just like, everybody is really interesting, thinks about what they're saying. Obviously you pour in a million people, that's not true of everybody anymore. I mean, people have, I've heard people say like about Usenet, if anybody's old enough to know, remember Usenet. I know some people old enough to remember Newsnet that they say that was the golden age of social media. Like everybody was interesting and polite to each other and just said, said things sincerely. They weren't looking for attention. Like that, that kind of, uh, you know, that, that kind of, uh, Usenet era stuff, um, that's going to be, um, and people, people talk, or people remember that from social media. Um, and, and, and that is, that that is going to change at scale and people say like why did usenet fail or like not fail but why did it sort of go out of style well because of millions of people poured in so it was the it was the smart people i heard somebody say this recently like it was like the top 10 percent or something of iq was there and as soon as everybody else came in it, it went downhill um i'm not endorsing that i don't necessarily think iq is what tells us whether somebody's gonna be good at social media but but it's it's it somehow there's like the best people of some kind of theory and but i do agree I don't disagree with that, but I agree that like obviously the more people you pour in, the more people you're going to get that aren't doing what we wish they would do. They're going to make the experience worse for other people. Um, how does that scale? Um, but I think that first, it's just super interesting to think of the minimal criterion at scale. Like that is that is that is going to kick in more. Like right now, minimal criterion is almost irrelevant, and that's why I don't know. I probably no one would notice it one way or another. It's it, it's not necessary at the moment. Because the people who have come in generally have some connection to me or my co-founders. And so there's a level of trust that they're just generally people have similar interests. And like everybody's sort of on the same page. There's a few, there's a few people who came in who, who probably weren't great, um, but like it's not really a problem at this point. Um, and so, um, so there it's, yeah, we've got this kind of like community. We almost curated. They're nice. And, and so it doesn't really matter. You, you might not even, I don't even know if you knew there was a minimal criterion. I'm assuming you didn't know that uh, when you visited there. You probably, I would assume you wouldn't know that. Is that it, true? It looked like there wasn't, but I assumed there, there had to be. Because yeah. you, um, you're, you're building a system that, because we can think of it topologically. So on, on Facebook, it's quite homogenous. And in your system, you can think of this landscape where you have peaks going out to the horizon and it's, it's much more even and balanced. And then you might argue, well, there's a real risk that you might have something very important which doesn't really get mixed together because you so many people are independently thinking of very important things and they're not being raised up because we don't have this kind of homogenizing force. But but then you can bring in, well, you do, because we're in a globalized world and everyone's everyone lives in the same world. Everyone watches the news. Everyone uses Facebook and so on. So there's this weird kind of like convergence from other platforms that will leak into your system. That's a, so are other systems leading to convergence in general, like outside those systems? That That's the implication of what you're saying. Um, so actually, I, I would just, so, just so I, I don't lose that train of thought about the middle criterion, I do think it's really interesting to scale. I'll just put that, like, so, to, to hold that point in the conversation, too, because, like, that's, um, you know, we see really interesting dynamics in these middle criterion algorithms, like when we run them, in, like, in, like with, without people, and, and, and they, they, they are very good at diverging and, and, and filling up a space of possibilities. Um, and so I think at scale, you would start to see that true filling. Um, like filling up because the space of possibilities that like we play with in these toy domains like a robot in a maze is not so interesting but the space of possibilities of human thought is super interesting um, and so I think that's one benefit at scale that like you've never ever seen an experiment like that at scale with people um, that will be interesting but you're saying that nevertheless like the world is inside of this kind of convergent loop like it's 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 most systems and it's not just like conventional, what you might call social media, but things like YouTube, it's like they're, they're all working on this like-based kind of convergence stuff. And I mean, I see commentary in the news every day, even, even today, like about um, why things like Pitchfork are closing down and stuff. Like it's like these, these ranking algorithms are turning into the controlling force of culture. Um, and I, I do wonder how, how much that's affecting 
uh, everything because, you know, like, uh, like things that seem weird to me culturally that I, I don't understand. Like, for example, it seemed like until around the year 2000 that like rock music was evolving in some way. Like you could be pretty sure that like the music of today is really different than 20 years ago. Um, and like, I was enjoying that <laughs> until around then. And then it seemed to stop. Like now it's like almost 25 years later. Like I, it doesn't sound much different from what it was 25 years ago. And I'm, I'm like sorely disappointed. I expect it to be in shock by now. Um, and I wonder if it's because like there's this major convergent mechanisms like across culture. Are, are you worried about um, objective measures creeping into Maven in the future? The ultimate like version of drifting towards quality over diversity is is a sellout. Like if I did that, um, but it's you know it's I would be a little worried because um, yeah like commercial pressures exist, um, but uh, I, I don't imagine myself doing that at the moment. It seems unlikely. I mean, that's our differentiating factor, too. It's kind of interesting. Some people have said, like, you know, you, you're going to have to introduce, like, these things in. Like, people just, like, somebody said to me, like, um, the only reason anybody's going to go to another social network is going to take their followers with them. Like, you're going to have to have followers. <laughs> and so I'm just like, well, but that's our differentiating factor also. So it cuts both ways. Like, if we just have follows and likes, like, why would why would you go to us? You already have that in your other network. Like, it's, it just absolutely makes no sense. I mean, I understand that's like the argument in things like um, Threads or Blue Sky or, or Mastodon. Like, they are basically just Twitter run by different management. Um, and then, like, you know, you kind of try to import your followers. Um, they all have a, uh, like, some other kind of, you know, motivation. Like, why why should you just go play the same game somewhere else? Um, some of them try to say like we have a more kind of like fun filled culture. We're not about arguing, but but I mean, who's to say that you can't control culture? Um, and so, you know, I, I think uh, just, I could just create a, creating another one of those is just not not going to do anything. It's going to be an absolute failure from business perspective. So in some in sense, in sense, it's an advantage that we are so different. Like it, it allows us to differentiate in this market. Um, and uh, I'm not sure w what we would gain by becoming more objective other than just like having no differentiation. Yeah. And I've been reading this book, Broken Code, talking all about the evolution of, of um, you know, Facebook. And uh, Zuck had this methodology of just copying everyone else's ideas as quickly as possible. But your one is so paradigmatically different, even more so now that I've understood it more deeply speaking with you, that there's no risk whatsoever of him copying it. Um, which is actually a bit of a moat. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so I can't get rid of likes. <laughs> that would be, or, file, or friends. I mean, that would be crazy. <laughs> Could you That's not going to happen. I mean, they could yeah. try to start a separate service, yeah. but I, I think it's way outside their philosophy to do something so crazy. Um, and so yeah. nobody else can get rid of it either. It's like X isn't going to get rid of likes. It's not going to happen. Yeah. So, and I, I, by the way, I think those services still serve a purpose. You know, I, I think of it not as social. I think of it as an announcement service. You know, like, I, I feel like it's really weird that we think that social means having popularity metrics, but like to me, it does help you to get a megaphone. And it's useful if, if you want a megaphone or if you want to listen to the people who like have, who you think whose megaphone you want to hear. Like, I, I don't feel like we should get rid of all of that. It's just very convergent because there's only so many megaphones to go around. Um, but there's nothing necessarily like there's a lot of bad side effects to it. But I don't think we should just completely get rid of it or that it's necessarily the case that Maven has to replace all of that. Like we can have something good for having megaphones and making announcements to our followers and we can have something for exploring and curiosity um, and they can coexist. And But yeah, I don't see uh, Zuck or anybody else in this field like going, going in our direction. Um, it's just impossible. Yeah, there was this really interesting thought experiment about a, a panopticon, which is this hypothetical building where I think it's a prison and everything you do can be observed through a kind of series of mirrors. And the whole idea is that when, you know, when you're in front of the judgmental eyes of others, you don't explore um, any new interesting behaviors, you don't discover yourself and so on. And we were talking about Jan LeCun earlier, and in a way, you might feel sorry for him because it's not necessarily that he's incapable or doesn't want to talk about other things. It's almost like because his personal identity and because people's um, understanding and expectations of what he says are so kind of diffused and solidified in the system, he has yeah. no free will. He <clears throat> can talk about nothing else because that's what he's supposed to say. And the yeah. only way to break out of that pattern is to kind of step away from your social personal identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah and which is really hard and risky and frightening to, to do that. Um, so it's it's true. I, I do think 
he, like almost everyone else in his position, is trapped. Um, that was why I went, it was very interesting to me to uh, experience just dropping out of my field, um, which I effectively did, you know, because I was like machine learning research and then just like nothing. Um, and um, my mind, like just outside of Maven, even like it just completely started going in new directions, like in machine learning. You know, because it's like it no longer mattered. Like I have no incentives anymore. Um, like, like I don't. I'm not trying to satisfy anybody's expectation professionally. Um, I don't have to publish a paper. So I just, um, I just noticed immediately like a liberation in my thinking, which yeah made me think a lot about this issue of why people start to get stagnating when they get older. Um, like, is is it just aging, or is there like more to it? You know, because of just like the the social effects being so powerful. Um, so I've, I've kind of been enjoying just like my mind being completely free, um, not not having any. I mean, I still have social media expectations, so that's still true. Like if I talk about AI online, I know what people expect. But like in terms of just like thinking about AI or what I need to do, I don't need to do anything. I just think about whatever I want to think about. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, I've often thought about this. Um, you know, yoga teachers talk about the tyranny of your social embedding. And of course, they don't use that technical language. They'll, they'll talk about it in terms of. Um, not thinking about your social world and just being present and experiencing things as they are and just being. But basically what they're talking about is escaping the, the tyranny of the social world, which erodes your agency and forces you to do things and makes you worry. And um, yeah, I agree with you. It's not about aging. Um, I, I, I think in, as, as, you, as you get more and more sclerotically in, ensconced in the social world, you kind of like, you, you don't even, you, your, your, your optionality just, just disappears. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very true. It learns this epic tag cloud, and it's not hard-coded in any way. It just grows over time. It's, it's a bit like a huge cloud. You know, a new interest arises, um, and it might be a side effect of old interests. You know, this is sort of like the idea of this like diverging, kind of like going into new areas from where you've been. You know, because if you're talking about computers, then you might start talking about AI as a, as a side effect of that. Now, AI is introduced to the system. It's a new interest at that point. Computer, you know, computers was an, was an original interest. Now we have AI as an interest. Um, it's implicit that like AI is related to computers. Like that's, if you think in a graph, they would be related in some way. Um, but we don't actually have like this massive data structure that shows all those implicit relationships. They just exist implicitly. We extract them at certain points. So like when you go to the profile of an interest, because like I said, you can follow interests as if they're almost like people and has a profile, like one section of that profile are uh, related interests and those related interests are known for reasons like that they co-occur. Um, and so it's, it, it understands that these have co-occurred before and it figures that out at that point. But the whole graph is not stored in any one place, at least not, not now. Um, and so it's an implicit graph that's growing. Um, and it has different aspects to it. You know, it's not like one graph either because there's also th uh, interest graphs that go through people, you know, because you, you can see that I have these interests and then I overlap, that overlaps a lot with you and then we can see what, in, what are the other interests you have. And so those are interests that are likely interesting to me too, um, you know, because like we share a lot of interests anyway. Um, and so we could actually say, you know, what is the graph that goes from interest to person interested in it to other interests to another person interested? So there's a, there's a, there's a graph like that too. Um, and all those exist implicitly inside of the system. And I think eventually we would, if, if the system is successful, we would analyze those. Like we would try to extract some parts and let you see it more explicitly because that would be fun. You know, it would be fun to see the graph, to navigate the graph explicitly along its edges and just see what this thing looks like. Um, it's a little bit like like visualizing like the, the family tree in evolution or something. It's like what's related to what. Um, and uh, that tool does not exist yet, but I imagine we would eventually build it um, just because it would be fun for people to see and probably also useful scientifically for, for, uh, for researchers. Professor Kenneth Stanley, it's been an absolute honor as always. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you again. Uh, this was a great opportunity. I always love being on this show. Be happy to be here any day. Amazing, amazing.